everybody, how are we doing? No, we're... <laughs> I love it, Brad. No one's responding to the bonus class. No, we won't be next Friday. I'll be packing up. I'll be getting ready to go next Friday, getting ready to go to Texas. So how is everybody doing? Can everyone, of course, hear and see me? Let's get some good mornings in the chat. Tag someone for another another 50 points. Let's do 500 points. Tag some people in the chat. Say some good mornings. Let's see everybody saying hello. Grab your Red Bull. Make sure I'm broadcasting this morning. Was it yesterday or during? It was during an office hours I didn't broadcast again. So we'll see if everyone's responding or if I am once again not broadcasting. I feel like I am broadcasting. Look, people are tagging people. That's a good sign right there. I see people tagging people. We like that. E either either people just decide to randomly start tagging people or I am actually broadcasting. <laughs> and thank you everyone for an amazing summer. It is Friday. Hey, good morning, Corbin. Good morning. And we are doing great. It's it's so funny. A streamer I watch on YouTube last night uh, started streaming and he didn't know it. Nothing crazy happened. But he's like, well, the streaming's not working. And for like the first five, ten minutes of the stream, he was just kind of like talking to himself and his co-host. And he's just like, well, this is not working in YouTube studio. <laughs> You're streaming. You're online. You're on the internet right now. So... It's pretty, it's pretty interesting with like the camera facing you. If anyone else does any sort of streaming thing, it's like, okay, there's the camera facing me, streaming. Let's do this, though. So we're hopping right back into it. We only have two more topics. Um, we are going to do an activity today, and I'm going to basically give away the points again. So good job, Nicole, right there. Another 50 points for Nicole. We're going to do an activity again today. Remember that um, I'll, I'll give you with the answers to this one. This one won't be a email me one, it'll just be one that you will get the answers for. So if you're here, if you're following along, you'll see all the answers, we'll explain how to do it. And I'll put up an activity and I'll have it due tomorrow night. But how long How long has the activities taken people when Brian says like, here's the answers or here's how to email me? On a scale of 10 seconds to 10 hours, how long is it taking you to do the activities? Which is, this is the goal of the activities. I.e., if you're here, 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, that's what we want. That's what I want with the activities that if you're here, it's free grades. So if you're not here though, then you're like, oh no, where's the activity? What got posted? What's going on? So for people who are here, they're getting the grades. That's the points. Um, and so yeah, we will do another one today and we'll work through some work. We'll talk about the models. And yeah, we only have one more topic after this. We'll mainly be covering on Monday and Tuesday. We'll make sure everything's spaced out correctly with the assignments. And I should later today be posting the take home. So get ready for the final take home. Um, I think it'll be, it won't be too bad. It'll be model focused based, making models, making things like logistic. And we ended yesterday with a big topic. We ended yesterday with a big topic. We only have one more topic here. We ended yesterday with a big topic and it was how to know if an indicator variable is significant in a logistic regression. Who here for the first thousand points of the day? Oh yeah, we'll do lots of stars next week. I think it's about the same level. Who here knows what kind of test we do to see if something like decade itself is significant in a multiple regression model? What kind of test do we do to see if decade is significant in a multiple regression? What kind of test would we do? It's a big review question from yesterday. I gave up big points yesterday and giving up big points today. How would we figure out if decade, the variable like decade itself is significant. You technically can, Nicole, you get a thousand for that. That's technically right. It, it, that's not the test we do, but that that will give us the result right there. That is correct. That does work. So I'll take it. That is that is a correct answer. What kind of test is that though? Like what what is visualized model performing for us? Um we wouldn't really use associate. Nicholas, I'll give you a thousand right there, but we wouldn't we because we we wouldn't get the multiple regression partial F, partial F Brennan's right. This is a partial F. And we'll talk more about why it's called this. Let's, let's just kind of focus in on what it's called right here. It's called an effects test. And we'll see this right here in just a moment where we look at the significance of it in the model. But this is a partial F test. Now, the reason is, and let's kind of go through the notes again. Let's look at what a partial F looks like. A partial F looks the following way. A partial F looks that if you're all the way down here at the naive model and you go up to the full model, this can just be like a full model or let's call it a complex. 
See, the problem when I learned something, I learned it as a full model, and now we often call it the complex model. It just means it has more stuff in it. And then you have the naive model. Now, this right here, the naive has no variables in it. The complex just has a bunch of variables. So what does this mean? Down here at the bottom, there's no x's. This is just like intercept. So the naive model is literally just like the intercept, it's y bar. That's what the naive model is. Complex model has like x1, da, 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 all the way to x like n. So it just has a bunch of x's. Does that make sense? Like this here is an f test. That is the f test. So we have an f test right here going from the naive to the complex. But if you pick any point between these and you take a model with fewer x's in it, you are taking a simple model. Streamlabs, you're doing great today. Streamlabs gets 100 points right there. And when you do this right here, this is a partial F. That is a partial F. A partial F is going part the way from the naive to the complex. So the partial F does not go from the naive to the complex. The partial F goes from a simpler model. So we'd go right here and go simpler model. So it's just simpler. What does simple model mean? It just has what, what's in the model. So what does a simple model mean? It just has fewer what's than the complex. That's only, that's how you define a, a simple model. A simple model, see I think about all these test questions. Alex is our, like our main test question person. Cause I think about like, what's a simple model? And you could be like, it could have the interactions removed. It just has less variables. It can have less interactions. It just has less. That's all it has, it has less. And you can see this right here with the following, let's hop back over here. We could make our, what's this? Let's go grab the bulldozer data and let's do this. Let's show this to be true. And everything should work as long as it's doing it the way, there's multiple ways it can do it. So let's hope it does it the ways, okay. Over here, we were having fun yesterday. We we're doing a bunch of, we did some afternoon office hour stuff. Okay, so we should be able to open up library reg class and we open up the bulldozer data. We load in the model. So to make a simpler model, we're gonna call this our complex model. And then we're gonna copy this. We're gonna call this the simple model. Yeah, we called it capital model. Ah, there we go. And we're gonna remove out decade. Does it make sense now with what I've drawn that when you look at this right here, you've got a simple model right here and a complex model. The simple model has fewer variables in it. So just focus in on that and be like, simple model, fewer variables. Complex models, more variables. We could even do the naive model, 1,000 points. Someone explain to me how to write the naive model. How do I make the naive model 1,000 points? How would I word the, how would I word, good question Alex right there, 1,000 points. 1,000 was created this today. Um, I would call a simple model, a simple model is defined as a model that has less variables than the complex. A complex model is defined as a model that has more variables in it than the, than the simple. Grant, you're basically right. Brad, you have the full model, and that's sometimes where we call the full model. The full model has every variable in it, and every variable is dot. That's why I paused here, because I didn't know if people knew how to write the uh, naive. I'm putting a 5,000 point bounty on the naive. It's my last crazy points for it. I mean, I'll give thousands out, but 5,000. It's in the notes, and I think we mentioned it a few times, but it's definitely one of those things that people might forget how to write the naive. No one might get this one. Does anyone know how to write the naive? I'm about to give it away. I'm about to give it away. Here we go. Here's the naive in three, two, one. There's the naive. This is the naive model. We can confirm this also by going to summary. I got the points. <laughs> we could go to summary of the naive. And if you take a look at it, all it has in the naive model is an intercept. Does everyone see this right here? The naive model only has the intercept. So it would just be a flat line. Um, we should, maybe we can draw it. We go, will it plot it? Oh, the residuals look fine on it. It's, um, let me try one last thing on this. If I were to, well, I know how to plot it otherwise. If I were to, if we can go to plot, and 
never I don't use plot that much. I think if we do this, we'll get it. Cool, that's got that. And then if you go to A B line and this might work. If it doesn't work, I have another way. Oh, it, it did work. There's the naive model. That is the naive model. So this is the naive model just going flat through it. We could also take and plot like the simple model through it. So, oh, so, oh, we didn't, we didn't make it. And there's the simple model. So you see, this actually has a slope to it now. So you see, this is the sim, um, it's just what it uses. Uh, ben, good question, 100 points, Ben, right there. Uh, it's just the way the code works. I hate to say that. Um, maybe it's that you're timing, timesing price by one, or you're just saying it is what the Y variable is. Like it has a one-to-one -one identity with the price. Like it's the, what it uses is it uses the mean of Y. And that's a good theoretical question, which I don't have a good answer to. So you know what, Ben, that's a thousand points. Cause I don't have a good answer to that. Um, the, my answer is that's what we do, but that's not a good answer. Um, I don't know why theoretically they chose one other than, um, it has a constant value. One's a constant. What happens if we put two in here? What happens if we put two? Let's find out. It's a good question. It doesn't like it. <laughs> it says you can't do that. Um, what if we put zero? Ooh, that worked. And that put in nothing. So now that has nothing in there. Um, but so that's not a good idea. The naive model is one. And why? I don't have an amazing answer to that right now. I'll try to I'll try to think about that or try to look into it. But um, that's just what the naive model is. That's how you write it. And it has only the intercept, which is the mean of y. And we saw that previously right here. So this is the mean of y right here. It's just a flat line. And that's what we get. Now, what we're going to point to here is we have our complex and we have our simple model. So you're on one. Or like, yeah, maybe it has to do with that with the trues and the falses. I don't know. I mean, that's a I, I, if it does have to do with that, I don't know why. If it does, I can't, I don't know. ANOVA going from the simple to the complex, if I could spell. This is how you perform a partial F test right here, is you say go from the simple to the complex, and it gets you right here the p-value, which is ridiculously small. And so with this right here, we see a very low p-value. No, good question, Ben. Great question. And so what you can do, though, watch this drop one, and you can go here to the complex, test equals F. There you go. If you notice right here, look at this number right here. This number right here, 332, is the same number right here. This P value right here, which we won't really get to see in our model, if we were to do a summary of the complex, these p-values right here, like this p-value here is this p-value here. Now, why does, good theoretical question, why does usage have the same p-value right here of 0.174? Because think about it, it's that thing we talk about. Why does usage have the same p-value? Think about what usage is, not like what it is literally, but how it, how it kind of works in the model. And why does it have the same p-value? Why does usage right here. What kind of variable is usage? It's different than all of this right here. What kind of variable is usage? And why does it have the same p value when we do it on a partial f test? It's quantitative. And it only has one variable. It's only one, it doesn't have indicators like this does. Decade right here. Good job. 100 points, Philip and Megan right there. You're totally right. It's quantitative. And decade right here has has three indicators because decade has how many levels? Review questions from yesterday. These are cool questions I can put on the test that are really quick. Decade has how many levels, meaning it has three indicators. It says four, Mila right there, 100 points. It has four levels, three indicators. And so when we take all three of these and drop them out of the model, here's what the variation, the, like the amount of variation it explains and how well it's doing. Do you, who thinks they understand what the partial F is doing? The partial F right here in this output is taking all three of those levels and dropping them out of the model together and seeing if all three of those um, explain more variation. Four levels, three indicators. Five levels, four indicators. Two levels, one indicator. So what's the rule? No matter how many levels you have, you'll have minus one indicator. So does that make sense, Alex? 100 points, Alex, good question. So if you have 10 levels, 
you'll have nine indicators. Where is this one going? Where, great job, Megan, her points. Where is this one going right here? When we drop the one out, where is it going to? Where is, where is this one that's going away going to? What is it becoming? That one that goes away becomes what? I think we will do, yeah, we'll do some off stars today. You got it, Sylvia, good question. Reference level. The one that goes away is the reference level. It becomes the reference level. So whenever we drop one of these out, like we're not literally dropping it out. It's just the reference. Like uh, all these decades right here, the 2000s, the 1990s, the 1980s will be compared to the 1960s, 70s. So we compare every other decade to the reference decade. So which is the reference level. Really good reviews from yesterday. People are doing amazing. This is, you guys, you guys are impressing me. This is really good. And don't worry if you get something wrong. It's just practice right now. It's not, it doesn't mean it's real till the test. So <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be better to get it wrong today and right on the test than right today and wrong on the test. So, but if you get it right today, that's really good. It's good practice. And so we're seeing how to do this all right here. Let's hop back to the notes. Let's go back. Okay. And one thing I was pointing out there or trying to show is you can take and you can drop one thing out of the model. You can always just drop one thing in and out, but you can't drop more than one. As soon as you drop one thing out, everything starts changing. I do know that usage is not statistically significant, but also decades are kind of contingent on each other. Like if we drop out 1980, 1990, or 2000, then we don't have all the decades. And here's a huge note. First person gets a thousand points in the chat. If you drop out an indicator, it goes to the reference level. If you drop out an indicator, its data goes to the reference level. That's a big thing that people don't oftentimes remember. If you drop out an indicator, its data goes to the reference level. Yep, I always got it right there. I always got the thousand. If you drop out an indicator, it goes to the reference level. That means if I remove 1980s indicator, all the data from 1980 would now be part of the reference level. So the reference level would be 1960, 1970, 1980. If I were to drop out, and we don't usually do this, it's just because if you remove out an indicator, it's like, well, then it, it goes to reference level. So that's just kind of one of the key things I think people just don't realize. It's like, no, there's still the 1980s data. It's just in the reference level. And you can you can do that. I don't suggest it. So we see it right there. Ah, so with significance in the model, and this is a very complex model, what, what does it mean that months is not significant in this model. What does it mean that somebody's months on the job is not significant in this model? What does it mean that somebody's months on the job is not significant in this model? What does that mean? What does it mean that months on the job is not significant in this model? Does that mean it, what does it mean though? In this multiple regression, what does it mean for months on the job to not be statistically significant? With all, not that it has no, no effect. So Sylvia is kind of on the right track with the other variables in the model, because watch this. Let's do this. Let's, uh, I know we're hopping between screens. We're just going to go over here. Let's see. Ah. So next we're to the computer. So we're going to do, we're going to load up the salary data. We're going to load up the model. And let's do this. Let's make a model here that just has months in it. So now months, months is statistically significant. So months is statistically significant here, but in this model, months is not statistically significant. Why is months not statistically significant here, but in a model by itself, it is statistically significant. This is an important thing about multiple regression that in the multiple model, it's not significant, but by itself, it is significant. This is the party example. Um, I don't see the answer yet. This means that in a multiple model, months does not bring with it what? In a multiple model with the other variables accounted for, months 
does not bring with it what kind of information? My drink is disappearing. In a multiple model, new information, Henry. Great job, Henry and Mila. You got it, 100 points right there, Henry, Mia, James. New, useful information. So months has useful information. But with the other variables in the model, months does not bring with it new, useful information. We could look at the VIFs to see if months is overlapping. And yeah, oh, you know why? Um, probably has to do with the interaction. Interactions are built from variables. So oftentimes, if you have an interaction, you're going to overlap like months and education months, they're they interact. So they're going to kind of fight each other for their for their explanatory power. And we see also that this is not significant either. So it, it's hard, it's harder for something when there's an interaction to be significant in the model. We also saw a weird paradox yesterday where we had a very significant model and nothing in the model was significant. Statistics is weird and awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we understand here with months not being statistically significant, that means that months does not bring with it new variation that is not accounted for by the other variables. And we see some interpretations. Interpretations are good. And p-values. So when we do the p-values, like we've been saying, each individual p-value is going to look at whether it brings with it new information that the other variables are not accounting for. So if a p-value of an indicator is significant, then it's actually different from the reference level right here. If a p-value for an indicator is significant, that means that it's different from the reference level, which we don't really care about. We are going to care if the p-value is significant for the variable itself. We wanna look at the categorical variable itself and see if that brings new information. So we have a lot of ways of doing this. We can do it with correlation and all this good stuff. And let's take a look. This is one of my favorite examples right here because what we have right here is the number of body piercings in someone's weight. And it is true that people who weigh more generally have less body piercings. And you can see here that there is a negative correlation to your weight and your number of body piercings. As in people who weigh more generally have less body piercings. But guess what? All of this is pretty much due to your gender. So we see right here, gender male. Where's gender female? Where's gender female? People should know instantaneously, where's gender female? 100 points first person, where's gender female? Megan right there, reference. It's a reference level. <clears throat> and think about this. We have here two otherwise identical individuals where one individual is male and the other individual is female. The individual who is male is what? Two otherwise identical individuals where one individual is male and the other individual is female. The individual who is male is expected what? Two otherwise identical individuals where one individual is male and the other individual is female. The individual who is male is expected to what? It kind of makes sense when you think about it. Like, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Kind of makes sense. Because see what math we get. Let's look at this. We could go right here and go 135.0. 9062. What does this mean? And just think about what that what that could be right there. Two otherwise identical individuals where one individual is male and the other individual who is female. A thousand points first person to finish it. I wish we man, I want to do our written test again. Because this is where I see if people really know how to interpret these coefficients. Because someone will say like they'll say like being male increases your weight by this. And it's like, I, uh, that one's not as bad as like getting more body piercings increases your weight. No, that'd be horrible. I mean, that's not, I mean, I'm not saying that's horrible, but that's not a good interpretation. Two otherwise identical individuals where one individual is male and the other individual is female. The individual who is male is expected to what? The individual who is male is expected to what? Try writing it down. Make sure you have it written down. Have your pen out. Be writing it down. So who's got it? Thousand points on the line here. I don't know why the drink's vanishing today. What? I'll repeat again. Here we go. Two otherwise identical individual. Wait. Between two otherwise identical people, where one is male and the other is female, they are expected to differ in their weight by perfect meal. A thousand points. Well earned. Meal's perfect interpretation right there. 
Yep, between otherwise identical. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> otherwise identical. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even notice that I said it straight through. And so think about this. This right here looks a lot like the mean for females. And this right here, when we add the 43 to it, that looks a lot like the mean for males. If you look at a uh, number of body piercings, it's not statistically significant and the coefficient's rather small. You could say two individuals who are otherwise identical who differ in their body piercings by 10 are expected to differ in their weight by one pound. And once again, that's not saying if you get body piercings, you'll gain weight. It's just saying we have person A, they have zero body piercings. We have person B, they have 10 body piercings. We expect their difference in their weight to be 10 pounds. I mean, one pound, one pound, one pound, because sometimes they have by 10. Um, so it's not statistically significant. So these differences might just be by random chance. It's only one pound. It's a very small difference and probably just by random chance. And so when we have a singular variable like this, and that's what the next slide says, you can look at the significance of just it. Because what can we do with one thing? We can just take it in and out of the model. You can look at a two-level categorical variable by just looking at the p-value of the indicator. Why? Why with a two-level categorical variable can we easily see if it's significant or not? Think of what's going on with indicators. Why with a two-level categorical variable? Here's, here's fake multiple choice answers. It has one reference. It has two references. It has two indicators. It has one indicator. What would be the correct answer in the multiple choice? Why can we look at the significance very easy for a two level categorical variable? It has one reference, it has two references. One indicator has two indicators. What would be the right answer there? What would be the right answer on that multiple choice? Why can we easily assess the significance of a two level categorical variable? Waking everyone up this morning here. Who's got it? Who's got it for the 100 points are there? It'll have one indicator. It'll have one indicator. It has just, there it is right there, because male, female, one indicator. Everything will always have one reference. So one reference, someone could say, well, like, well, it does have one reference. Well, everything has one reference level. Every variable we add has one reference level. Great job, 100 points right over there. Everyone, Emily and Nicholas and Philip and Megan and Brad and Ben. So keep call it, talking, keep practicing because everything has one reference level. But the reason we can assess a two-level categorical very easily is because not it's one reference level, it's because it has the one indicator. So there we go. <laughs> it has one reference and it has one indicator. But if you had a five-level, a five-level would have one reference and four indicators. So, yep, yep. And so it's not two categorical variables, it's a two-level categorical variable, as in like, um, we could do yes, no. Yes, no would have the reference level, I am first. So no would be the reference level. So it'd be like, did you wear glasses? So glasses, yes, would be the, um, would be the indicator. And so if we have a three or more level, which is what it says below, we have to do the partial F. This down here is when you do the partial F. Down here, when you have a three or more levels, you will have two or more indicators. With three or more levels, you will have two or more indicators. So three or more levels, two or more indicators, and you have to bundle those up and drop them out of the model together. So let's take a look at that right here, and we're seeing it, that if we have something that is statistically significant in the multiple world, it brings with it new information that the other variables are not accounting for. Now, if we have something that is not statistically significant, it doesn't mean by itself it doesn't have information. It just means when it's added to the model, it does not bring new information. This is so key about the multiple world, is that a variable that is not significant in the multiple world is not a useless variable. I mean, it could be, it could technically be, but in the multiple world, we are assessing how it does with the other variables in the model. Please know and understand that. That's something that's like, it's like, wait a minute, it's multiple, three or more levels, then you have two or more indicators, two or more indicators, Philip, three or more levels, two or more indicators, like, Four levels, three indicators. Seven levels, six indicators. It's always indicators minus one of levels because there's one reference. So you just subtract off the reference. Great job, Philip. And there's not statistically even. Here we are. And take, <laughs> I love the lawsuit time on the bottom here. So at the very bottom of the screen right here, 
you'll notice that we have that there's need for a lawsuit. Because what do you see about gender in this model? Gender accounts for variation that the other variables are not accounting for. That even if you have two otherwise identical individuals, that they have the same education, they have the same experience, they have the same months, we'd have the same interactions then, knowing their gender gives you new information. And we'd expect these people, where one is male and one is female, to differ by $450 in their monthly salary. $450 in difference. And this is the Harris Bank lawsuit data. And so the verdict was discrimination. So ah. <laughs> we've got right here attractiveness and all this good stuff right here with facial hair. And remember how we said facial hair, uh, yes, would be, well, we talked about glasses. There we go. That's the indicator. And oh, glasses is statistically significant. No. And it's a negative coefficient. <laughs> so between two other, sorry, I've got glasses. Not today, though. Between two otherwise identical individuals where one is wearing glasses and the other is not wearing glasses, the person who is wearing glasses is expected to have a attractiveness score that is negative 0.24 below the person who is not wearing glasses. What do you have right here? Facial hair. Oh, got to grow facial hair. It's because between, is it statistically significant? It is statistically significant. Between two otherwise identical individuals where one person has facial hair and the other person does not, the person with facial hair is expected to have an attractiveness score of 0.2718 higher. Now, this one has to be interpreted differently because this one is a what type of variable. This top variable is interpreted differently because it's what? Well, I'm about to change my interpretation right here. 100 points. Who knows? Why am I changing? Kind of numerics, kind of right? Quantitative. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, it's basically numeric. It's quantitative. We would say, I understand numeric, but we usually say like, yeah, got it. And so uh, between two otherwise identical individuals, because it's multiple regression, um, the person um, who is one unit higher in their face symmetry score, which I don't know the units of that, is expected to have a attractiveness score of 0.174 or higher. There we go. We got hats on here. Hats is not statistically significant though. Let's look at that partial F test though. When it comes to the partial F test, the partial F test is now called an effects test. So there's a key term right here. And the way I memorize that's an effects test is because we're talking about the effect the variable has as a whole. So an effects test is gonna go to our model. Let's take a look at it. The effects test, if we run it on this model, we'll look at the effect of each one of these variables. So an effects test is so easy to do. All you have to do is do drop one of your model and it'll run the effects test. Now I forgot one last thing we do have to do for this one right now, test equals F, capital F, and you'll get the p-values. Now this one's not as interesting because it has only um, the one level ones, which are gender. But if you notice here, we get gender here but when we run our model, we get gender male. Because what is the effects test looking at? The effects test is looking at the effect of gender, not the indicator. So when you look at your bulldozer model from earlier, let's go way back to the bulldozer model right here with the complex. And let's go here. So let's go to summary. So if we do a summary of the complex, we will see all the indicators. But then what does the effects test do? Nice job, Philip. Thousand points, Philip. Keep those notes in the chat. The effects test is going to tell us the effect of what? Thousand points. The effects test will tell us the effect of the variable what? So I'm going to do an effects test right here with drop one, which drops one out of the model. It drops individual one items out of the model. And we go to complex. And it's going to tell me the effect of what? It's going to let me see the effect or the total effect of what variable that I'm interested in right here. It'll be like, oh, let's look at the effect and tell me what variable I want to look at right now. Hint, I got it highlighted. It's going to tell me the effect of what when I run this. I'll get to see the effect of this variable. And what variable might I be interested in? Ah, uh, well, 1980s isn't a variable. 
So these are indicators. They, I mean, they're indicator variables, decades, Stevenson, thousand points. It's gonna tell me the effect of decade. Do you see how it actually, it drops the whole variable out of the model. Does that make sense? So these are indicators made from the variable decade. Decade is the variable itself, but the indicator levels or they're indicator variables, but they're from the levels. So when I run the effects test, it lets me see the effect of the whole variable. Does that make sense why it's called like an effects test? Like what is the total effect of decade? And down here, it just gives me the total impact of decade. It takes all of this and drops all of this out of the model. And so then it says, okay, here was the total impact of decade. If you were to take all those variables out of the model, it drops mm -hmm. it. Well, and when, why it's called drop one is it drops like usage and looks at that model. Then it drops decade and looks at that model. Does bulldoze have, I'm gonna look at what other variables it has. I should run STR on it. So we've got years. See, we don't have another categorical variable. Um, here, watch this. If you were to do something like this, we'll do a crazy one. Height tilde dot. Drop one. So this is going to be a ridiculous amount of output. So what did it do? What did it do right here? It dropped each one of these out of the model. So I made a model predicting height from all these variables. So what did it do? It looked at the effect of each one of these variables and it dropped each one out of the model. You can see something interesting with handedness though. Handedness has two degrees of freedom. And so the reference, the reference isn't really dropped. It just doesn't even exist in the model, but nothing of that variable is included when we remove it. Why does handedness have two levels? Well, two degrees of freedom, i.e. two indicators. Why does handedness have two? And it's not because of this. I mean, it's because of that, but it's not because of this. Ah, Philip, you're so close. It's not this. It's also this. Why handedness has two degrees of freedom. Because handedness, if you take a look at the model, you will only see two levels to handedness, but something's missing. It's ambidextrous because ambidextrous, which starts with an A is the reference level. So there's two indicators because the third one is ambidextrous. I know, right? <laughs> I can't spell ambidextrous either, but that's why we see the two. If you see things like, um, is there another, I think gender might be the only one. Um, but you'll notice that these are the indicators. You see how it says like handedness left, handedness right, gender male. Those are the indicators for the variables, gender and handedness. So important stuff going on right here. What's going on with this is that we run the, when we run the drop one, it drops out. And let's hop back to the notes. The effects test looks at the effect of a variable in the model. And usually we use it when there's three or more levels because it allows us to bundle up those levels and toss them out of the model. And so we could do it this way, but it's much easier to do it this way. This is the long way of doing a partial F right here. You'll get the same results. I mean, don't worry, just do it this way. It's nice and quick. All you have to do is take your model, say drop one, and it'll drop out each variable it can and it takes it from the equation. So we just drop it out and we can see right here, what do we have? We have a model with fitness score, a face symmetry and a parent race. And when you compare these models right here, the differences between them are what? The differences between the model, which means a parent race right here does what? Because this is this, a parent race does what in this model? I think this is Dr. Peter had like hot or not data he used for this. A parent race does not bring with it new information that helps explain somebody's attractiveness score. So comparing these two models, attractive race, there are multiple errors. It drops all of them. I think we can say right here, watch this, boom. So what it does when you run the drop one is it takes fitness score, face symmetry, and a parent race and drops them all out. It looks at the impact of fitness score 
face symmetry, and a parent race. So it goes through and it does them all. So drop one drops like each one of them out of the model. So it drops this, drops this, and drops this. But when it drops a parent race, a parent race has three levels. And since a parent race has three levels, it has what? Since a parent race has three levels, a parent race will have what? Since a parent race has three levels, a parent race will have, it will have two degrees and two indicators, yeah. And that's where the two degrees of freedom come from. Um, we don't talk too much about degrees of freedom here because they're kind of used in like, kind of just more of a mathematical term. They're, they're gonna take up degrees of freedom. <laughs> it's like, you would never really tell them in the business world. It's just like a mathematical calculation to figure out like which T or F distribution you're using. So we don't worry too much about that in our class. We don't say like, oh, let's calculate the degrees of freedom. It's, it's just done for you in the background. You're right. We can remove one variable at a time. Brad is 100% right. And let's show that Brad's right right here. Watch this, Brad. You ready? Let's take this complex model right here. Let's go back. And let's show, let's show that Brad is right. Watch this. You ready, Brad? We're going to make this model here. And then we're going to do a summary of it. And so if you look, oh, did I not make it? Oh, I think we don't have the, we don't have that data frame open. There we go. Okay, so take a look at the p-value for fitness score. Can I just remove fitness score from the model like this? Can I just take fitness score and just take it out of the model? Can I do that? Because it's one thing, can I do that? Can I just drop fitness score out of the model? Yes or no? It's just one thing. Hint, hint. It's just one thing. Yep. It's just one thing. You can drop that into the model. You can just you can just take one thing and go like, yeah, toss out of the model. But a parent race has two levels. So if I want to take those two out of the model, I have to bundle them up and take them out of the model together. Does that make sense? If I want to take out those two things right there, I can't just take one of them out. I have to bundle them up and take them both out of the model together. So to do that, we write the complex, uh, we write the drop one. And here's what you'll notice. If you look at the p-value right here, the p-value right there, and it might just be due to, yep, it is, good, 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 I was a little worried. The p-value right here and the p-value right here are what? Look, this is fitness score, this is fitness score, and their p-values are what? The p-values for these two things are what? They're both fitness score. They are what? Well, they're both significant, but look at what they are. Look at it. Look at every decimal of them and ignore that there's another zero. They're the same because the drop one is just saying like, what happens if we remove that? And we can remove it. It's, we can just do that right there. We can just take it in and out of the model. But this p-value down here is based on removing these two things. So this p-value down here is the total impact of a parent race. And it's when you remove out both of those, how it would change the model and the significant impact it would have to remove out both of those. So this p-value right here is different because it's based on removing two things because a parent race as a variable brings in two indicators because there's three levels. Does that make more sense, Brad? That you can just remove one thing out. You can take one thing and just, just toss out your model, but that'll shift everything. So when you have to remove two or more things, you have to do the partial F, and a drop one will do a partial F on everything. I think, is there more? Let's get the, look at, not glimpse. Oh my gosh, there's so many variables. There are so many variables in this data frame. Clothing style. <laughs> let's do clothing style. Let's see if that helps. Okay. Let's see clothing style. We are going to, okay, we have this right. We're going to add in clothing style. And now, oh, there was only, there's only two things of clothing style. But what if we have more than one, cal ah, yes. So now I actually have more than one categorical variable. What it'll do is it'll do the exact same thing to this as we see. So here we can take and so what it's gonna do is when you do the drop one, it'll do it on every variable. 
So the drop one right here is doing it on a parent race and clothing style is also categorical. If you remember from this output right here, clothing style has conservative or revealing. So do we have right here that there is two categorical variables in this model? So when I do drop one, it does it on every variable in the model. It does a partial F. So actually, how many partial Fs did I run right here? Thousand point question, how many partial Fs does drop one run for me right now? How many part, it's gonna compare a simple to a complex and how many times did drop one run a partial F for me over here? Well, who knows? Mila, you're at a thousand, but that's not right. Good, good guess right there. How many times did partial F run down here? Alex, you're right. It, it dropped out this variable and it told me if that brought with it new significance. Dropped out this variable over here. Dropped out this variable over here. Dropped out this variable over here. So it ran a partial F four times. Does that make sense? That this ran four partial F tests for me. It looked at a model without this, told me the significance. Looked at a model without this, told me the significance. Looked at a model without this, told me the significance. Looked at a model without this, told me the significance. So it's actually doing the partial F four times. Does that make more sense? So, so those scores are the only, that the variable being dropped out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reason that this is identical to the summary is only because it's one variable. So the reason we get the same result right here as we see like this p-value here and this p-value here is the same is because we're dropping one thing in and out. Now, if you drop more than one, then we're gonna see different p-values. So good job. And let's hop back. Okay. That's the partial F. And there's the drop one. And you can see weird things right here. Because check this out. With this variable right here, does knowing someone's pet, what pet they own, bring with it new information that the other variables are not accounting for? Does knowing someone's pet bring with it new information that explains college GPA that the other variables in the model are not accounting for? Does knowing someone's pet bring new information that the other variables in the model are not accounting for? And the answer is most definitely yes or no. Does knowing the pet someone owns bring with it new information? It does. Nicholas, 100 points right there. You're right. It does because it's statistically significant. That's what it means to be statistically significant in the multiple model. What is the reference level for pet? 1,000 points first person. Cat, dog, both, or neither. What is the reference level for, for pet? Cat, dog, both, or neither. What is the reference level? That's, that's a good question, too. I like that. I'd love this. That's a decent test question. Both, first alphabetical. That's all you got to do. Reference level is both. And um, so we go right here. We don't see both because it's the reference level. And the interesting thing, though, is all of these p-values are what? All of these p-values are above 0.05, which means that these are not significantly different from the reference level. Since all these p-values are above 0.05, there is not a significant difference from them and the reference level. So it's kind of weird. Like you don't have, it. there's nothing here statistically significant, but the variable itself is statistically significant in the partial F. So that's what tricks people all the time. People are often like, what? How can, how can this bring with it new information, but none of the indicators are significant? Well, it's, it's the variation accounted for by the full variable, which is seen right here, not the differences that all of these indicators have from their respective reference level. So little tricky stuff right there. And we see right here, things we've been saying, and time for our last topic of the, maybe not, yeah, we're gonna do activity after this. Last topic of the day, interactions. When it comes to interactions, what are we talking about? An interaction is the way in which X1 explains Y depends on X2. The way in which X1 explains Y depends on X2. There is not a constant change. So if there's no interaction, there'll be a constant change, but the strength of the relationship will change if there's a strong interaction. So let's take a look at the mathematics right here. All we are going to do is we're gonna have an indicator. 
So if you were to say, do a partial op, ba basically, well, not all, so let me clarify that, Grant, good question. So every drop one is a partial F, not every partial F is not a drop one. Every drop one is a partial F, but every partial F is not a drop one because drop one is just dropping one variable out. But in a partial F, I could drop eight variables out. Does that make sense, Grant? Like a partial F is just a complex to a simple. So if you drop one out, that's a complex to a simple. Like you could say, take your complex model, drop one out. That's what a drop one is. You drop one variable out and it looks at dropping any one of the one variables out. So a drop one is a partial F, but not all partial Fs are drop ones. Cause you could drop two, you could drop three, you could drop four. Cause the partial F just goes complex model with a lot compared to a simple, which could be just dropping one out. Does that help make sense of a grant? Is that the same as the effects test? Effects test is a drop one. Good question right there, Brad. The effects test is a drop one, which looks at the effect of one variable being removed from the model. An effects test is a drop one. Those are synonymous. So an effects test, so let's wait, let's go through, ready? An effects test is a drop one, which is a partial F, but not all partial Fs are drop ones. So effects tests are drop ones, which are partial Fs, but not all partial Fs are drop ones. Yes, good questions. So when we look at an indicator in a categorical model, what do we have right here? We have that the indicator is going to be multiplied by another variable. So when we do this right here, the coefficient right here is going to depend on the indicator. Because look at this. If we multiply by this indicator, we are going to change what this B is. And what will we do to these two terms? We'll add them up. We'll add them up. Indicators multiplied by, you got it. Let's take a look. Here's all the mathematics. Because what's going to change about this model? What will change right here is going to be the intercept and the slope of x1. So take a look. Here we are with something that has zero for its indicator. When we go in here, we're going to plug in zero right here, which means it's not on. Plug in zero right here, and these terms just go away. So we're left with this right here. But down here on the bottom, we have this and we have this. I want to be very specific. Thousand points. What does this change? There's a hint over here on the right. What will this now change about the model? Right here, this will change the what of the model. What I have highlighted will change the what for a thousand points. That will change the what since it's turned on right there. Kind, be specific, be very specific. What will that change? Hint, look at this and then look at this. What will this right here change? The hint is over here. Hint is right. What will this change now about the model? This one will be, this one, once you get it, we'll know the answer to the next one very immediately. Megan, you, Megan, you're basically right. Megan, you got both of them. This right here will change the intercept. Does everyone see here that this is going to change the intercept? But then Megan's also right that this right here, if you look at this term right here, this will change the slope. So we are changing the intercept here and the slope here. So we have a different intercept and a different slope. What if the interaction is very weak? If the interaction right here is very weak, like if the interaction has a coefficient of zero, what would not change about the lines? If the interaction had a coefficient of zero, what would not change about the lines? If the interaction was really weak and had a coefficient of zero, what would not change about the lines? The slope. And that's when you see that, that's weak, and the stronger it is, the more perpendicular it is. So does that make sense that the strength of the interaction right here is what controls the change in the slope? 
So the more perpendicular the lines are, the stronger the interaction. The more parallel the lines are, the weaker the interaction. So we can see that, that strong interactions have perpendicular lines. And that's what we're noticing, is that the coefficient of the interaction is going to be a difference in the slopes. So that is key. Okay. Here we are with an interaction term right here, which is actually not statistically significant. Dun, dun, dun. And we see this. But which line is going to have a steeper slope, the male or the female? Let's take votes. Let's do votes in the chat. I'm going to pull up Streamlabs, do polls, do a new poll. We're doing male or female. Male, option male, command M. And so which of these will have a steeper slope, male or female? Did it appear? There we go. So MRF, vote in the chat now. Which of these will have a steeper slope? Who knows? So when we look at this right here, we can get the answer by looking down at this. And we need to look at this. Which of these will have a steeper slope? 100 points of your right. Take a vote in the chat. Which of these will have a steeper slope? No. Let's see. I'll get another 30 seconds. Let's see. Okay, we'll, we'll end the poll. Let's solve this mathematically here. You ready? Let's take this output and let's solve it. You ready? Let's see if the class is right. Brian's going to try to solve this. He's going to take this output and he's going to go here. And let's hop over here. Okay. Let's see if the class was right. You know where this is going, right? <laughs> Sorry, class. Okay. Let's write out the regression equation. I think I'm better when I write this one out by hand. Okay, so we're going to go right here, and we're going to say college GPA. So that's what we're predicting is the Y variable. You can see it up there. That's the Y variable. I do this on the test sometimes. Oh, I can't write out the test. I got to get used to this because I one of my favorite things is to ask people to just write the equations, and we just you just write it down like this. Oh, we'll do that. Sure, why not? And does everyone see the pattern I'm doing? I'm just going to take and add to it each thing. So hopefully people notice the pattern I'm doing. Um, just going to, that's rounded. We should multiply it. And then I think I got enough room. And last but not least, we got to go a little smaller here. And then we want to go plus and then go and then we'll go right here and do that times this so this let's do this here this is our regression equation does this make sense to everybody right here this is the regression equation take a moment and write the equation for female 5,000 points first person in the chat write the equation for female write the equation for female who can do that? I feel like there's ways to do this on the test, but it would require a lot of box inputs. Write the equation for female. Hint. Here's a small hint. That's a small hint. Here's another small hint. Write the equation for female. 5,000 points first person. I think that's got it, Mila. Yep. And also Ryan and Mila both got there right, you're right there. Because all you're going to do to do the equation for female is go right here, plug in zero for male. And once you plug in zero for male, then this term turns, does everyone see that this is going to turn to zero? Because it's something times something times zero, zero. This term right here is also going to go to zero because it's something times zero. And there is female GPA. We just figured out a female GPA. So that is the prediction line for female GPA. And then we go to male GPA. And what am I, I going to plug in? This is hints for your homework. 
what am I going to plug in for uh, gender male now? Gender male can only take on hint like rain, no rain. Um, gender male can only take on one of two values. It only takes on zero or what? One, exactly. Just like your homework assignment. Hints for the homework. We put in one, we put in one. And if you look at this right here, well, that's just times one. That's just times one. So this will change the what now. What will that right there change? The blue highlight will change the what. The other one, just like we were talking about moments ago. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, literally like we were talking moments ago, this changes the intercept right here, which is going to subtract from the intercept. And this changes the slope. And I just added those on right there. There we go. So that is the, there we go, male GPA. Have you noticed the difference between the intercepts and the slope? So we could kind of highlight here again in two and show that this is a different slope. And this is a different intercept, wrong color. Ah, do it. Wrong thing. No, what am I doing? <laughs> there we go. And so you see the different intercept and you see the different slope right here. So males have a steeper line. Males have the steeper slope. And you can also see this because this right here, this coefficient, think about it. This is going to increase the coefficient of high school GPA. So just going back to the output, you can see here if somebody is male, it's going to make high school GPA have a higher coefficient for the, the, just the term itself. If you look down here, this value is the difference between the slopes. This 0.13, I should have just done as 0.13, but this 0.13 is the difference between the male slope and the female slope for GPA. Does that, who feels like this makes sense now? Hopefully seeing the mathematics right here in this example being like, okay, we can solve this equation. This is how we write it out by hand. And then we just plug in zeros or ones and we solve the equation. Yeah. Once you do it a few times, if you do this by hand a few times, you'll just be like, oh, you just, you just write the numbers, you just put them in, you solve it. Once I realized, you just go y variable equals intercept plus this times this plus this times this plus this times this, then you plug in the values. You plug in ones or zeros. So literally, and I miss doing this because I usually do it on the whiteboards in Haslam. I miss Haslam. I usually go here and I just erase this. This is the way I do it in class a lot of times. And all we're gonna plug in right here is either zero or we'd plug in one. Those are the only values we plug in right there for gender male, zeros or ones, because they're indicators. And that's all we do with indicators because we treat them as categorical. I mean, as quantitative. <laughs> What's up back right here? Okay. And so you can see right here, here's the mathematics. Once again, uh, I do everything in the slides, but I like to do it by hand because I could just point to this and be like, hey, read it. Hey, it's, it's everything we just did, solving the equations with all the decimals. Cool stuff. If you look here, you can see which line is the male line. The male line has the steeper slope. So the male line has the steeper slope. And the interaction is not statistically significant. So it's not a statistically significant interaction. So what does it mean for an interaction to be statistically significant? It means it brings new variation the other variables are not accounting for. If it's not statistically significant, it does not bring new variable, new variation that the other variables are not accounting for. That's all it means. The weaker the interaction, the more parallel the lines. The stronger the interaction, the more perpendicular. But do not, do not just like be like, hmm, those look, those look pretty perpendicular. I mean, they cross. Every line that's not perfectly parallel will cross. So don't, you have to look at the p-value. Because I've had people be like, those are perpendicular, Brian. That, that's, a, that's a strong interaction. I'm like, but <laughs> any lines will be perpendicular if you extend them out. I mean, unless they're parallel. Unless they are literally parallel. So we see right here the coefficients. It is not statistically significant. It does not bring with it new variation. Here we are. Regression equation with three or more. So it's just, I think we're going to see the decades one now. So here we go. Here's the, oh, this is the family child one. What line will be the steepest? Will it be uh, middle child, oldest child, only child, or youngest? What line will be the steepest when it comes to the coefficient of high school GPA? 
what line will be the steepest? Middle, oldest, only, or youngest? What, what line will be the steepest? And hint, we already have the line for middle, because when you do the line for middle, the line that'll be the steepest. We have some answers. Let's see what people say in the chat. We have two answers so far. This is a decent test question, too. What line will be the steepest? And I'm wondering why people are, I'm trying to think why people are saying a certain one right here. So these, he'll slow it down so they see if people see it. So I'll point to some stuff. All of these coefficients right here will change the what of the model. All of those coefficients right here will be their differences in their what's. All of these coefficients, all of these coefficients right here will be their differences in their what's. Careful, 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 because slope is controlled by this, and I don't see that in this. All of these will be their differences in their intercepts. This will change their intercepts. Does that make sense right here? That this will, when you plug in zeros or ones right here, that'll change the intercept value. Does that make sense? So if we look at the oldest child, the oldest child's line's intercept should be 0.339 lower. So we go to oldest child's line, which we, do we not? Oh, hold on, we didn't write that one out. But the oldest child's line will have an intercept that is that much lower. Ah, you see it, Corbin, great job, yep. So now, these coefficients down here change the what. These coefficients are associated with a change in the what's between each line. These coefficients will change the, let's see in the chat, will all change the what's of the line, the slopes. So since the slope is positive to start, the one that's going to make it the steepest is going to be the oldest child because it it has, and I, I would like, you know, what would be good is if I did, this one was negative because there would be a lot of output to look through here. And the the middle child just has this value. If you notice the middle child, all of these indicators would become what? This is why writing the line for the middle child is always like such an easy question on the test, but it looks so confusing. If we were to ask the line for the middle child, all of those indicators become what? If you say write the line for the middle child, every indicator becomes a blank, zero, yep. So if you notice this equation right here is literally just this. It's just intercept plus high school GDP times this, because every other line has a different intercept or slope compared to middle child. So middle child is the easiest one, right? Yay, middle child. So I love this type of question on the test because it's like, write the line for middle child. It's like, oh, zeros for everything. You just take all these and you just, eh, you don't use them because they're all zeros. They're all not indicators. So really, oh, and there we go. Those are lines. And here we are. If you take a look, the drop one shows that the interaction is not statistically significant. Now do watch out because I know the lines are perpendicular a little bit. But like I said, any lines that are not perfectly parallel will cross. Uh, here we are with the drop one again. And the drop one is done in the visualized model. So you can get the drop one in the visualized model because the drop one, run, one runs an effects test. And there that's 0 0.7969, 0 0.7969. So it's really nice that the visualized model gives you the, the drop one effects test. Oh, look at that. I think so. I think we'll do 4 p.m. office hours. I think we will today. So we see the effects test right here, but wait a minute. This line is perfectly parallel to these, but it's not statistically significant. It just does not bring with it new information not accounted for by the other variables. But boom, this one is ridiculous. This one right here with decade is ridiculously significant. So we have here that this brings with it new variation that the other variables are not accounting for. And I think that does it. Let's hop over to activity now. Let's start doing some activity. So we're going to open up. Oh, you guys can't hear that, can you? Nope. I wonder if you could. Hmm. Okay. We're going to open up an activity now. Assignments. How is everyone doing on this Friday? How is everybody doing? I'm going to find one right here. What do people have planned for the weekend? That's a good question right there. What are people's plans for the weekend? Okay, good. I know which activity we're going to do now. I want to see all these exciting plans.
This is too easy. This is too easy. All right, here, I'm going to add another question to this. While all you guys are telling me your plans for the weekend. It's way too easy. It's You guys are like, no, don't add another question. <laughs> but it's... Um, how many indicators make five level? There we go. This is such a easy question. Okay. Did it save? Okay, cool. Here, I'm going to publish this. This is, I think, activity four buy for us really stop being crazy what are people saying their plans are work studying need to study fishing fishing oh cool fishing i got a, i got a friend from college who fishes a lot he catches a lot of fish too did this work stop being weird canvas go we're gonna post this right here and we'll put it due tomorrow night all these oh wait, the times are changing there we go it says save and publish okay it should be published now and ah it didn't i did a new question why did it not don't do the quiz yet <laughs> Don't, whatever you do, don't do the quiz because it does not have the question. So if you do it, you'll have to redo it because it doesn't have the question. Don't do it yet. How many? Update question. Got it. Points. Okay. Two seconds. Save. Will it actually save this time? Okay, now I think it's got it. Okay, we should be good. Okay, we should be good. Nice and easy. People have maybe already done it. I know. Are you taking three classes? Three classes right now? Oh, man. Well, we. I will say this. Uh, we've had a lot of success on the Discord. And you know what? I'll try to use the Discord a good bit this weekend. So the Discord, people are on there kind of hanging out, talking. And it's really cool how it works. This one, finance and business law. Whew, Sylvia, good luck and keep working hard. Keep working hard. Good, great job, Sylvia, and everyone else. So let's look at some using R. The activity. Who who's looked at the activity already? Let's see how this is going on right here. Has anyone pulled up the activity, started it, and taken a look at it? Who's taken a look at the activity? It's pretty easy. I I made it. Sixteen. <laughs> Done. <laughs> I know was, there was only two questions, and then I made it three. There you go. Did I? Have, who is that? I have no idea. <laughs> it's really easy. Wait, I have no idea what's going on in the chat. I have no idea. Okay, so let's 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 end Friday with a little bit of fun here. Let's end Friday with uh doing a little bit of model building. What, I guess, uh, here, so the activity's posted. It's pretty easy. The questions on the activity, I'll look at them again. Just looked at them, but I didn't, where my brain jumped and forgot what they are. The reference level is the first alphabetical. That's true. How many indicators does a five-level categorical have? How many indicators does a five-level categorical have? How many indicators does a five-level categorical have? Four. Yeah, that's, um, once you know these types of things, it's just instantaneous because you're like, oh, you, you have five levels, well, then you have four. And these are kind of the big things. These are like, there's things you should know instantaneously about this chapter and things like that. And also like, what are we dealing with? What kind of variables were we dealing with yesterday and today? The type of variable we were dealing with was a what, what in the model. The type of variable we are dealing with is a what, what in the model. I'll start building a model here. The type of variable we were dealing with was a what, what? Categorical and then, mm -hmm, but a categorical what? Because I'm going to do something crazy here in a second. I'm going to give you guys a peek into the future for Friday. Our last topic. Let's 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 mention our last topic right here. We have the activity done. Free bonus points activity. 
and I'm going to mention the last chapter we're doing, which will be Monday and Tuesday, and then we'll we'll finish up on Wednesday, but we won't really do, I don't plan to do new material on Wednesday. The last chapter, because think, it was a categorical what that we were dealing with here. Here's the hint. It was a categorical what that we were dealing with. It is categorical, that's, that's quantitative, but all of these are what's. And this leads us into the last chapter. We did interactions also. So we did interactions. Computer, stop being weird. We did interactions. It is about logistic. And this, we were dealing with categorical what's. Every one of these is a what in the model. Indicators are for categorical. I'll take predictors, um, explanatory variables, X's. There we go. Um, indicators are for categorical X's. So guess what the last chapter is? The last chapter is when we have a categorical Y. That's the difference. So indicators are categorical X's. Logistic is a categorical Y. So let's see that. Let's do this. Let's go here. Go to data survey 10. And here's a change. You guys are going to hate this. But watch this. GLM. Now, why is it called GLM? <clears throat> GLM is um, generalized linear model, or it's a general linear model. It has different things. The family Gaussian right here is the, the, normal, mo the normal model we're using, but we're going to use a different model. We're going to do y tilde x comma family equals, and then we'll do data equals. So I'm going to do, I'm going to predict gender tilde height comma family equals binomial comma data equals survey 10. There we go. I have now made a model predicting someone's gender from their height. Summary, M. That's the coefficient of height. But you can try to figure out what this means, but over here's a big tip. Visualizing always helps. Can someone, without even talking about statistics really, help us out and explain this. What, try to explain in words what's going on with this model right here. What's going on in words? And what are we predicting here? What is this model? It's a totally different model than we've seen. What is going on with it? What are we, we're predicting this now. We're using this X. And this is the relationship it has. Mila, you're right. Mila, that's another thousand points, Mila, great job. Two individuals who differ in their, their height by one inch, the person who is taller is more likely to be male. Two individuals who differ in their height by one inch, the person who is taller would go up this scale and be more likely to be male. Does that make sense? Just like think about it Look, and what, what are we saying? And we don't have a multiple model here, so we could do, we don't need to say otherwise identical because we just have one variable in here, but two individuals who differ in their height by one inch, the person who is taller is more likely to be male. And you don't even have to mention the coefficient because the difference is not always the same, but this is a monotonic relationship. And so you could do different things. Two individuals who differ in their height by one inch, the person who's taller is more like a male, Corbin thousand points right there, that's exactly it. And do not mention this coefficient because that's not a difference in their probabilities, it's just positive. There's a, the person who is taller is more likely to be male because the coefficient is positive. Do we have like number of body piercings? Cause that would have a negative coefficient, that's why I ask. Let's see here, attach survey 10. Num tattoos. Let's see here. Num. Num tattoos. There we go. Two individuals who differ 
in their number of tattoos by one, the person with more tattoos is what? <laughs> Emily cracking me up, 100 points only. How would you numerically define indicator again? Uh, so indicators are for categorical Xs and they're zeros and ones. They can only be zero and one. Two individuals who differ in their number of tattoos by one, the person you could say less likely to be male or more likely to be female. Either way works. Um, you could say they are less likely to be male, more likely to be female. Like I would say, I would probably say it this way, two individuals who differ in their number of tattoos by one, the person with more tattoos is less likely to be male. And now the coefficient in the model is negative. The coefficient in the model is negative. Does that make sense that this one goes down and has a negative coefficient? This one goes up as a positive coefficient. Also notice that this one looks steeper. Like you notice how this is a really sharp curve and guess what? It's very statistically significant. This one down here is not as steep. It is actually statistically significant, but it's not nearly as steep right here behind my head. Was it number of contacts? Ooh, look at that one, look at that one. Do you think, so this one was very statistically significant. This one was barely statistically significant. And this one right here is, n <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, but here's the p-value right here. Here's the p-value that for two people who differ in their number of phone contacts by one phone contact. Two people who differ in their number of phone contacts by one phone contact. The person with more phone contacts is less likely because of the negative coefficient to be male. They are less likely to be the level of interest. Who feels like this won't be that bad of a chapter? Because we've actually just done maybe 50% of it. We've made the models, we've looked at it, and we've, we've interpreted it a bit. And that's the biggest thing is that, th this is why that multiple regression assignment uh, counted so much, is because everything we're doing right here, we could literally go in here and add the following. Guess what we have now? We now have a multiple logistic model. A quick speed, yeah. This right here is basically our quick speed run right here. So I'm doing like a slow run. Wow, but take a look at this. We have height, we have weight. And then our, well, you know what we should do? We should do a height weight interaction. We should just do that. We won't add in number of tattoos. But now what has Brian created? He's created a multiple logistic model. And everything in the model is statistically significant. So take a look at this right here. We have a multiple, and we might even be able to graph it. Mm. Will it? It did. Yes, because it can. So what we've created here is kind of the end all be all of this class. We have created the final graphic we need to see. Notice here how we have different models, different logistic curves now. And each logistic curve is based on the implicit lines for someone who has a very small weight, medium weight, large weight. And why do these different thousand point question, why do these logistic curves have different steepness? Why is there a different steepness to each of these logistic curves? Like the steepest one looks to be when weight is small. At larger weights, it's not as steep. Why is there a different steepness? kind of slopes you're kind of right and how how would the slope change like look over here you can see that these have different steepness why would you have a different slope variable or a coefficient of a slope why would there be different coefficients for weight this is what we just finished talking about a moment ago why would there be a different coefficient of weight in how it explains probability not really the p-value the coefficient of of a uh, height technically i should be saying so why is the coefficient of height different? Here's a hint. The coefficient of height, how it explains the probability of male, depends on somebody's weight. The coefficient of height depends on someone's weight. Because for a thousand points, what? So I'm saying the way in which height explains somebody's probability of being male depends on weight. There is a what in the model?
What is what is in the model right here? Interaction meal right there, a thousand points. Yep, the interaction. So because of the interaction, watch this. If I remove the interaction, now take a look at the visual now. Do you see how all of these right here have the same steepness? They're all like parallel to each other. They all follow each other right there. But previously, they're not perfectly parallel. Do you see how now they kind of change and they, they're not like this one shoots up a little bit quicker. They're not perfectly parallel, but these are parallel because there's no interaction. And here there is an interaction. I know, right? Mueller doing an amazing job. Excellent work. We do, Let's do this. Ooh, well, that's how really hard to see right there. Yeah, no, no phone contacts. Weak variables. Ah, let's see if this does an interaction. Ah, it's hard to find interactions when you really want to find them. Ah, that one you can tell. So here, there's an interaction. And let's remake the graphic. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something. Loc equals that. Okay, cool. So here, we have an interaction term in the model. Does everyone see? <laughs> Does everyone see that these lines, these sigmoidal models have an inter intersection that kind of overlap? But if I were to take away the interaction term in this model, how would these look? If I change this from the interaction right here because of the star, then what will these things be if I, if I don't have an interaction? They will be completely and utterly what without an interaction here. They will be what to each other? Thousand points first person. Parallel Brad right there. And look at that. And they also overlap, just, yeah. So they're parallel, but, and also it's so weak that there's really no change between them. So if you notice right here, there's an interaction term and the interaction actually kind of looks to be significant. Uh, where's the p-value on the interaction? Let's look at the p-value on the interaction. Uh, it's a little strong. Oh yeah, the interaction is statistically significant. Here's the p-value on the interaction right here. And we know this because it's the weight number of phone contacts p-value. So everything we've been doing today relates to this. Um, also, if you were to look at just like the variables themselves, it looks like they're pretty weak. Uh, number of phone contacts is super weak. Um, and we can visualize that right here. Yeah, number of phone contacts has a very not steep model. And if you look at these right here, this is how number of phone contacts uh, explains somebody's probability of being male. But what do you think really, what do you think explains someone's probability of being male? Would it be their weight or their number of phone contacts? Which of these makes more sense? That if people have different phone contacts, that'll explain their probability of being male, or if people have different weights. Yeah, it's, it's weight. Um, that's why when you look at the models over here, or the p-values, the p-value for weight is statistically significant. The p-value for phone contacts is not significant. And these are very flat. Last question of the day, you ready? 5,000 points. A perfectly flat model that would predict the probability of just the overall level, like 50% of people are male. And it doesn't have to be 50, it could be 51 because it would be based on the data. Like if 51% of our data was male, what model is this that would just be completely flat and predict the same probability no, no matter what X is? A flat model that predicts the majority level this is the last question of the day worth 5,000 points. A flat model that predicts the majority level. What kind of, what is the name of that model? The naive Henry, amazing job. Henry's right. It's the naive. It's the naive model. The naive model is the no knowledge model. And this is showing you the naive model through here. Or is that, it, is it showing you the 50% or the naive? That might actually be showing you the 50%, but the naive model is a flat line that predicts the constant level. And we could check this out. Do we have another variable in here? Check out that's a two level. That would not be, we could figure out what the naive model is. We could just go here to table and we could divide by n row. Yeah, I don't, that is actually not the naive because it's just 50, 50. But the naive model is the flat, Will that do it? No, we want n row survey time. There we go. Wait a minute. Didn't, I know Henry's just crushing it. Henry, great job. Great job, Henry. Henry's jumping in with those really hard answers, like those throwback answers. So great job, Henry. Yep. I, you earned it. 
You got it. That does it. Any any questions before we take a short break right here? We'll do some office hours later today. I'll try to release. I should have the take home released, but great job. It's our it's our last weekend. Oh my gosh. When is the final? The final be redu will be <laughs> reduced. The final will be out on Wednesday and Thursday. The final will be out on Wednesday and Thursday. So it'll be due on Thursday. It's showing as available. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the final showing is available. Well, what? I gotta do a take a look at this. It might have like a spot. Um, yeah, I think like, yeah, no, it's, it probably just shows like, yeah, like they, it's just like, it says like July 1st. Um, let's change it. Let's make it so people know. Okay. Shall I, there we go. Okay. Ah, I hate that. There's, there's so many things you have to change in Canvas to change one thing. And so we're going to do July 2nd until 2 p.m., which is what we did. Now, once again, you don't have to take it on July 2nd. You can take it on July 1st. Um, and I'll be making changes to it and adding it. And I'll probably try to make it, if I can get it out by Tuesday, that'd be even better. Um, <laughs> is it three assignments due next week? Let me look at the assignments due. Let me look at that, Alex. So, oh, but I think here's some good news, Alex. Um, the assignments due next week. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do this. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, you now have one, you have one less assignment. And I'm making it very clear. Okay, so let me show you guys and gals what I did. So I removed out one of the logistic, let me just change the name of this. So there's only one logistic assignment and it's still due July 1st. So we have the assignment due uh, tonight. Yep, it's tonight. And then we have logistic due on Wednesday. There is a bonus assignment, which I'm not, you don't have to do it. So, and, and so yeah, always be asking me what's going on. Always be like, hey, Brian, this is a lot. And I do realize that this is a lot, but with the work I'll be putting out this weekend, do not wait to like, oh, I'll do everything on Wednesday. No, 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 no. Um, this gives you time to study this weekend. And no, and that's why Alex always, well, thank you guys, like, just talk to me. No, no. I, oh, gosh. You know, I just hate it that, like, people be like, oh, we have too much work. Like, just, no, just tell me. If you tell me you have three assignments, I'll be like, let's change that. Uh, the take home will be due on Wednesday. So here's what you don't want to do. Now, this is where people are going to freak out is you want to study this weekend. You want to look at the take home this weekend. Um, you want to maybe look at the logistic assignment this weekend. That's why I wanted to kind of cover logistic just for a moment right now, just so you had an idea. But like, I'm not saying here, if I was you, here's what I would do. I would, um, one, get the assignment done for tonight. I'd take, I would probably take most of Saturday off and just relax. And then Saturday night I might, or Sunday morning, I would start looking at the take home. This is if I was you guys. I would start looking at the take home on Sunday and I'd start reviewing my notes by going through the take home on Sunday and looking through it. And then next week, I would start doing the logistic assignment on like Monday and Tuesday. I'd come to office hours. I'd get that done on Monday and Tuesday. And I'd finalize my take home on Tuesday. And then on Tuesday night, I'm probably studying. And then on Wednesday, I'm probably studying. And then I'm done on, on like Thursday. Like Thursday morning, I probably wake up and take the test. You can take it on Wednesday, of course, because that's when our class ends. But I'm extending it through Thursday to like give people just extra time if they need it since it's a online take home test. So that would be Brian's plan. Let's write that down. Here's Brian... If he was a student, what he would do. If Brian was a student, so Friday, this is Brian's student plan. Brian is a student now. He's going to finish, uh, what time Thursday is? Test you 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Finish assignment, it's 9, right? Is it 9? Yes, yeah, not 9. Finish assignment 9. Saturday. I'm just going to say relax on Saturday. Sunday. 
I'm going to dedicate most of my Sunday to that. Monday. There we go. There's Brian's plan as a student. How does that look? Does that look pretty good? So you got some time to relax in there. You got Saturday to relax. Working on the take home and studying is not so bad. Monday's pretty chill. I mean, I would, you might study. You might throw in some extra study. But there is a bonus assignment. I don't know if I would do it. You can if you want. But there you go. So, um, yeah. This I think this is pretty evenly spaced out it gives you like a day to yourself you've got a spare day in there you've got saturday and then a lot of the days are like work on the take home which i don't think yeah so this is brian's plan if he was you guys and so there are, we have 10 assignments so i don't think the workload is, is too bad but please always talk to me i'm just always you know <laughs> i just i don't know i always think back to where people are like this was not fair i'm like no just talk to me just talk to me just tell me what you think so that I'm glad we got the logistic and we'll finish up logistic on Monday, Tuesday. And then that it's just people are going to where people are going to freak out and we might have like another activity we do, but people will. I understand where the confusion is going to come in because people are going to see, oh, we got logistic. We got model building. We've got the you just don't want to be like, I'm going to do the bonus. and I'm going to do the logistic and I'm going to do everything. That's eh, not that bad. I'll probably help with it. I'll probably do it during office hours, too. So I'll help with it, Emily, if you want, if someone's behind on their assignments. And um, the grader is going to love us. The grader is the grader is absolutely going to love us. Um, I'm probably going to ask her, hey, <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. <laughs> it's grades will probably be getting finished up like by the weekend and and your grade updates. So you'll kind of know where you're at. Like you'll know if you're on track to get an A or a B or a C. Like the the bonus assignment won't drastically change grades. Oh, well, thank you. No, 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 no. I'm never gonna say that. Thank you, Ben. No, and I appreciate it. I can't wait to Ben. Yeah, because you you took two hundred one, and now because yeah, it's right, Ben. Right, you took two hundred one, three twenty. Now you're gonna take four seventy four. That's awesome. No, I'm always, I always, you know, I, I remember what it's like being a student, and I'm not about to be like, eh, just. A lot of work. It's kind of what I said last week, right? I kind of was like, it's going to be a tough week. I know. That's so awesome, Ben. No, I'm glad. glad ben, great job. Keep up the great work. And I'm proud of... I, I never think ill of my students. I always think that everyone's working really hard. Everyone is trying their best. Um, because you know what? If I'm wrong, then so be it. If someone was not trying their hardest, if someone was not giving it their all, that's okay. I'd rather think you're giving it your all and be wrong than think you're not giving it your all. Like, oh, they're not trying, they're not trying, and then be wrong, and you were really trying. That'd be way worse. That's That type of error is way worse than thinking my students are hardworking, and I really believe that. I don't just think it because I'm like, oh, I should think you're hardworking. I really think it, and I know it because I've seen the hard work firsthand from my students, and I, I have years of experience of knowing students work really hard for their grades, and they want to learn and want to achieve. And so I assume that about every student. So... Type two error, you're right there. Right there, Emily, thousand points. That's a secret thousand points. Emily's right. Type one, type two error. We don't want to make so be a false negative. Yeah. I should just depending on how you define your nulls and alternatives. Great job, Emily. Throwback answers right there. I love it. Awesome. I will be back. So hang out. If you want, check out some 474. We're gonna be doing some cool stuff in there. Um <laughs> yesterday I took a break and I didn't respond till like 6 or 7 p.m. at night. So very sorry if it took me a while to respond yesterday. I was just like, I just, I'm going to take a break. But no, I, um, the way I do it, Brad, is I just, I, I just at all points check my email. And the longest I take a break is usually four or five hours during the day, which yesterday I took a big break. How do we get that? <laughs> you come back in and you visit former students. I'm really, you know, like Tyler and them dropped by. So you can always come back by. And I guess that's the big thing is like, um, you know, thank you for everyone who supports the channel. And one person wrote in their view, like, this guy thinks he's a YouTuber. 
well, I mean, I, I technically am, but I'm not like, that's not who I am. Like, that's not my primary purpose is to be a YouTuber. My primary purpose is to be an educator. Um, and so, you know, I don't think, oh, I'm a YouTuber. I think I'm a person who teaches on YouTube. And so I really appreciate what everyone does when they just like, if you hit like at the bottom, if you subscribe, if you put a comment on videos, and I got to start reinforcing those things more. Um, you should make vlogs. <laughs> I know I could, I could make vlogs from Texas. So we could have like the weekly vlog update. So maybe we need to do that, Emily, like Brian's weekly Texas vlog update. Like, I don't know, something, who knows? This is what people do on YouTube is they test these things out. And um, I'm gonna start making more videos. Um, if you notice, I was making videos at the start of this class, but whew, a lot of work, a lot of work. Ran out, I mean, just there's only so many hours in the day and I'm packing up my apartment. So, and thank you, thank you everyone. Like, uh, was it Wednesday? My brain overheated in 474. They'll tell you. I was like solving a problem and I couldn't get it. And we spent a lot of class with me being like, well, wait a minute, it's this. And I just, yeah. What up, Connor? What up, Connor? So good to see you. This is Connor drops by. Connor, how many points do you have? Wish you had points to Connor. <laughs> so good to see Connor. Connor, how many points do you want? And I'll be like, oh, Connor, we got to add, we got to add more points to you, Connor. Connor's got more points now. <laughs> I wonder if I, oh, wait. <laughs> I think I did it quick enough that I put your points in. But I'll be back here in a moment, Connor. So chill out, Connor. Hang out. We're finishing up. Look, wow, Connor. You're just, man, Connor. <laughs> Stream always was being quiet right there. I will be back in four minutes. I will see everybody then. Watch this. Hey, Jason. Jason? 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 <laughs> We've almost got these new intros ready. We're almost there. This has been going for like 20 hours. This ends now.
Hey everybody, it is one of those random Fridays. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Start off with a little bit of randomness. How is everyone doing right here? I was like, you know what? I missed the randomness. You got some randomness. Start your Friday off right with some randomness. How is everyone doing? Striked, copyright striked. Can we copyright strike stat 201? Should I, do? I don't want to yell it. <laughs> Can we copyright strike stat 201? I don't know. We should do it. I've thought about like playing like some people's videos in the background just so they might see it. What's up? Good morning, Jordan. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Yaoji. So good morning, everybody. How is everyone doing? We were looking over the um, schedule. Let me look up your guys' schedule to make sure. We'll just do a talk about your guys' schedule. We'll, we'll see how we're doing. So let's look at the assignments. We will have the take home due on Wednesday. I'm gonna kind of make a plan for everyone here. And let's take a look. Okay, so we have vanilla and regularized logistic. Now, after class yesterday, we did focus in on some of the homework. So do remember that during office hours, you can see, has anyone, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> support vector machine and neural networks is a bonus. We'll start talking about tree-based models today. But has anyone been using like yesterday after class, Jordan and I were hanging out and I think was Caroline there? Maybe Caroline was there the previous day, but um, we were doing parts of the assignments. Has anyone been using those to help them, especially for some of the for loop stuff? Has anyone been looking at those and being like, okay, let me follow this through. Let me, there we go. That's what we want. So do realize a lot of there's, there's a lot of help in these videos. We go through it, hang out during office hours, be looking at those. And um, I try to add in the timestamps. I will say this, here, let's do this, thousand point bounty. Put your timestamps in the videos. If you have not been getting bonuses, um, put in um, a timestamp in the bottom of the video. I think we'll do some office hours today. Yep, everything should be good. We should be doing office hours. We might do some afternoon office hours. Oh, I've been needing some coffee lately. <laughs> Man, it's just like, I cannot wait till uh, July. I know I keep saying that, but I think I'm just so excited for, you know, like moving in with my fiance and just like new apartment. And my, my apartment right now just doesn't feel like my apartment because I've like ripped it apart and I've just got like a studio in my bedroom. So it's like, it just doesn't feel like, doesn't feel like my place. And then I'm just like, my place is not here. My place is in Texas. My heart, my heart's in Oklahoma right now and it's going to Texas. So with that in mind, uh, I think we've got a pretty good schedule. If you look at this right here, we're gonna start talking about tree-based models today and how to analyze them. Pretty cool stuff. Support vector machine is cool, but it's not cool enough to be a homework assignment. It is cool enough to be on the test a little bit. We will talk about support vector machine and put it on the test, but this is a bonus homework assignment. So please realize, your main responsibilities will be tonight's assignment. You will have an assignment next week that will be due, and you will have a uh, take home that is due. The take home will be mostly model building, and it will have things like tree based models and support vector machine. But what's what's really nice about all of this? I just I love the carrot package for this reason. Is that that's Akaiki? When you look at the carrot package, when you look at the methods. Where is the methods? So available methods in carrot package. So the available, oh, six available methods. We have more than that. Whoa, yeah, here we go. Wow, oh my gosh. Is this really, is there more than I thought? Oh my gosh. So if you look right here, is this, let's see, wrong button, method value. So if you look right here, we should be able to go to, wow, this is actually a really good page. Let me put this in the chat. So net, let's do net right there. GLM, there's all the GLM boost. So many things right here. Random GLM, random GLM, GLM, GLM step AIC, GLM net, there's GLM net. Um, this page right here, which you might be able to find, or no, we won't, I won't we'll put neural nets on the test. No neural nets, but support factor machine will be on the test. So support vector machine will be on the test, no neural nets. What is it? GBM, that's a boosted, gradient boosted, and H2O, I have no idea what, <laughs> I have no idea what a GBM, I know what a GBM is, gradient boosted machines, but I have no idea what an H2O is on the end of it. Greedy prototype selection. Actually, I might've been reading something about that yesterday. 
I think I literally was reading and a former student contacted me and yeah, is there going to be an online response? Yep. That'll be due on Wednesday slash Thursday. It'll be open till Thursday at 2 p.m. So there'll be an online respondents test again, and there'll be a take home due Wednesday night. So here, let's take a look. Here's what we'll look at other than looking at all these. I could look at these things all day. And I just like, this is like Christmas right here. Cause I do know some of these things. Like I know what fuzzy, fuzzy means, fuzzy classifier. So, um, the fuzzifier, Dr. Siever is big into that. And I know, I don't know what the hybrid is. It looks like it's doing some sort of classification neural net hybrid independent component regression. I don't know what component regression is. K nearest neighbors. We know that and regularized linear support vector machines with class weights. In other words, here's everything that carrot can do. Here's everything that carrot can do. Can carrot do a lot? Is the last thing I want to say on this really can carrot do a lot? What do you think? What, what are people's reviews on carrot, the function, the package carrot, and all the different methods, you know, when you do method equals, here's all your options. We're not even done with them yet. You could go to a random one and ask Brian, do you know this? Do you know what a support vector machine with exponential string kernel is? Eh, I kind of know that one. I know that one decently. Carolyn's right, right there for 100 points. Yep. Also, all these SVMs, I know what support vector machines are. I The Bayesian lasso. Ooh, what do you think with lasso this is? Lasso is a form of what? Which I haven't actually looked into this one. I know what Bayesian is. I know Bayesian models. Lasso tells us that this is some type. I literally am thinking of writing test questions from this right now to be like, what does what is one thing you would know about uh this model right here from seeing this basically jordan uh glm net will be lasso ridge but this is some sort of regularized regression so it's got a regularization in it it's going to try to control for um for validation and for uh variance sorry v words it's going to try to control for variance with lasso and tree augmented naive Bayes classifier structure learner wrapper. You got me. So let's go over to the plan right here. I, know, I mean, I know a few of those. I know what tree based are. Okay. So let's look at our schedule right here. See what we have going on. Let's make sure we have an assignment due tonight. We have an assignment due. Um, that is Tuesday. I believe that is Tuesday. And this is a bonus. This is bonus. You do not have to do this. This is bonus. You do not have to do this. It is bonus. I can't state that enough. If someone's like, Brah, ah. <laughs> you have an assignment due tonight, which we've covered all the topics here on regularized and vanilla logistic. And then you have tree based models due next week on Tuesday. And then you have support vector machine. So here, I think this plan does work. Is it I think it's assignment eight for you guys, though. Let me change that. So someone doesn't say I have assignment eight and assignment nine. Cool. Almost did the same amount of assignments in both classes. That's awesome. And I think this plan works for everybody here. Okay. Later tonight, I'll be releasing the take home. So here is if Brian was a student, here's what he would do. Today, finish assignment eight, come to office hours, work on it, get it all done. Saturday, relax, just, you know, you can work, that's fine. But you know, take some time, relax on Saturday, be like, I'm gonna have a nice day, I'm gonna eat a nice lunch, I'm gonna go on a walk, I'm just gonna watch some TV, I'm gonna relax, and eh, maybe I'll do some studying, but relax. Sunday, work on the take home and study be like, okay, I need to like, okay, I'm going to work for an hour, take a break. And then I'm going to study for a little bit. Then I'm going to work on the take home. But I'm going to dedicate like five or six hours on Sunday. I would, I'd, I would, if I, this is, if Brian was a student, what he would do um, on Monday, come to office hours, finish up assignment nine on Monday. So it's always good to be ahead of the game. So on Monday, come to office hours, finish up assignment nine. I'll probably be doing lots of office hours next week. I know you guys are working hard. So I'm going to be working hard next week too. We're going to get it done together. So on Tuesday, I would finish up the take home on Tuesday, even though it's going to be due on Wednesday. So we're kind of going one day ahead. Does everyone see this game plan right here is that we're one day ahead. So we're putting in a buffer. We've also got Saturday where we could, you know, do extra work if we want, but each of these things we're doing is like a one day ahead. Like we're going to finish up assignment nine on Monday, even though it's due on Tuesday, we're going to finish up the take home, which we started looking at on Sunday, but we're going to finish it up on Tuesday, even though it's not due till Wednesday. Then, so what are we doing Wednesday? We're going to review on Wednesday, which we've already studied a little bit here and there, like reviewed our notes, but we're reviewing Wednesday because what are we doing on Thursday? Thursday, we're taking the test. And basically, once you take the test, you're done. So we can put a slash relax. Or who's starting another class on Friday? <laughs> no way do we start another. Does next session start on Friday? Does it start? 
you bet, Kelsey. And and I'll try to have I will have questions on there that are going to be on the test. So um, July sixth, yeah, I was like, no way to. <laughs> like they wouldn't be like, okay, class starts on. It'd be weird. I, mean, I guess they could have done it on Thursday, or Friday, but it starts on Monday. Man, and this will be the first time I have not taught a summer session, summer session two in like five years. This will be Brian's first summer off, which you know, as an adult, I don't mean that people are not adults, but like when you go into like when you get a job. <laughs> oh no don't be sad jordan but you see like i don't it sounds so rude one time someone told me when you grow up and get out from under your parents and i was like i was like how old was i i think i was 27 at the time and that does feel really young now like just because just because i'm 38 now not because that is really young but they told me when i was 27 when you're like older and you're out from under your parents and i was like my parents haven't paid for anything for like forever like I was quite offended when they said that to me. I, I do think it, to this day, I still think that's offensive to say to someone. So I'm not saying that to anybody here. What I'm saying is, is I've like for the last five or six years, pretty much the longest I've had off. I'm kind of lucky though, because I get a lot of time off for Christmas. So I'm luckier than most. Like some people may like, I only get like a week off for Christmas. And because I teach, I get like uh, three weeks off. So you know what? Pretty lucky. But now I'm even luckier because I get like a month off. So we're going to have a month off. going to, Moved to Texas, so excited, relax time, you got it. So if you're also getting this month off, have fun, relax. If you're not, don't worry, keep educating yourself. And I will say this, one of the greatest honors I had yesterday was a former student contacting me to say, hey, Brian, I need to get help with some of the topics we had in 474. So just yesterday, a former student was writing me saying, I'm working at a job as a data analyst and I need some refreshers on these topics what we do is used even dr petrie is contacting me right now to say hey brian if you meant if you heard this in different class he was like this is what berkeley's doing they're using jupiter notebooks uh jordan and i were talking about this during office hours and we were looking into it and all the compilers and stuff and so um i know right and that's the thing hannah you're right um we are very focused on are the skill sets we are teaching you the most modern uh, what's being utilized by industry. That's our big focus with what we teach you. And um, that's where we get into the whole Python R war where people are like, Python's the best, R is the best. And it's like, well, if you know one, you'll have a good start for the other. Um, some people might say R is a little more academic and Python is a little more industry. There is that argument to be had maybe, but yeah. So, I mean, one of these days we could go Python, you never know. What, what's really good is if you go back five or six years, I think we were majorly lacking. Nothing against Jump, sorry, Jump, SaaS company, but we were mainly Jump back then. We were, a lot of our classes were taught via Jump. Like I taught regression via Jump. And I think that was a disservice. Um, and I'm so glad we made the change. Dr. Petrie was, he was the main inspiration for like, we have to get our students to be good at programming. And that's one thing that people have noted about our students is that they have a good foundation in coding and programming. People come in, they, they want you to basically have the whole goal is you come in with like a good enough skill set that if they have a technique, they want you to learn. Like if you, if you know how to use R, then they could be like, Hey, here's the Python code. And you'd have enough of an understanding to go through and be like, okay, that's the function. That's what it's doing. Um, because who, who's my other coders? I know we have a lot of people in here who like have coded and they will tell you if you know one coding language you can pick apart other coding languages. Like as soon as you start to understand one, it's not like you know the others, but you can start to pick it apart. Exactly, and jump's good. It's kind of a, jump is just like a, it's, it's basically a, it's an easy solution. And anything easy never gets everything done that you want. Jump is good, but it's not great. Jump is good, R is great. So that's why we teach you R is because you can do way more with R and people are always updating R. R is free. That's another big plus to R because um, Jump loves it. I mean, sorry, Jump, nothing against you. But Jump wants us to teach students how to use Jump because if we teach you how to use Jump throughout your whole undergraduate career, you go to a company. Imagine if everything we taught you mm -hmm. and it, it's a good it's a good it's a good package. Everything that you learn in 340 related to process control, Jump is great, and it makes all the graphics. Excellent stuff, Jump does. Um, 
and that's the thing. If you know how to analyze control charts from, from jump, you know how to analyze control charts. And here, let me show you one last thing right here. Watch this real quick. Wrong button. I'll show you something really cool right here. For those who have taken 340, let's go grab, let's do this. Let's do a quick search. Let's type in control chart package for R. So control charts for QI charts, okay, for CRAN. So I think it's QI charts. I have used this before. So Q, GG, QC, whoa, wait a minute. Are these GG plots with control charts? So GG, QC, okay. So if that is the name of the package, we should be able to go here and go to install packages, GG, QC. Is it? Oh my gosh. We just installed, let's do this, GG, QC, examples. So here it is, R control charts, and here it is right here. So here are the control charts. Let's go grab the data. There's the data. Let's, let's go back here to R, and let's drop it in. Let's start running it. We should have everything we need because that's what these things should do. Got the packages. Okay, warning, that's fine. That ran. Warning, warnings are okay. And here we are. If you know about lower control limits and upper control limits, we'll zoom in. And oh, there you go. But these are control charts. Is it not? It. I was hoping, let me try one last thing. Oh, I know why, I know why. This will be, if this works, this will be amazing. ggplotly takes an object and turns it to a poly object. Please work. It didn't like it. But if you look at this right here, um, you could build your control charts inside of R. And so you can get everything you want and have your run. So we've got the lower control limit, the upper control limit. You've got your three sigma limits. You've got the process mean. You've got your lower bound and your upper bound. But um, if it was ggplotly, you could. That's why I was trying to run ggplotly on it. Um, making it a plotly object. There might be things for this. There might be ways to turn this into a GG plotly object. And I was like, okay, if I can make it plotly, then I could hover over the points and I could zoom in on it. And I was really bummed that I couldn't do that. That would have been amazing. Um, let me look at one last thing. Wait, so we'll scroll down to here. So here's all the control charts they're doing. See, look, there's a, um, there's a Pareto. That's a really nice Pareto chart they're making. I'm just shocked that you can't. Let me look at one last thing right here. If you look at how, uh, I don't see where someone's making Plotly control charts. Um, here's all the Plotly library. There's so many things you can do with Plotly. So you know what? You could design these in Plotly. You could take your own time and start designing things. I actually used, used this page before, this page right here, and you can zoom in on these graphics. Um, you don't have to make multiple 3D ones. You can do that. But this is all with Plotly right here. So these are Plotly objects and you can take and just manipulate and do things. So a poly object, you can, and this is all being done inside of R. And just in case you doubt me, and you're like, that's not R, Brian. Okay, okay, you don't believe me, you don't believe me. Sure, let's go over here to R, let's take the code they gave us. We'll do this, we'll go to a new page, just so we can go here, drop all the code in, run all the code, and we should get the same object. And yes, this is being completely made inside of R right here. So there might be 3D control charts inside of R, um, I, or not 3D control, uh, make a 3D control chart and that'd be weird. So anyways, what is the point of this? The point of this is, is if you learn how to use R, you can go and find whatever you're looking for. You could write your own code. You could come up with a way to do plotly control charts instead of R. And that's what we're here to teach you. The whole point of learning how to code is coming up with your own ideas, coming up with new ways of doing things. You know what? I'd love to sit down with that control chart right there and make it a plotly object, Jordan. Like that would be my goal. If I was, if I went and worked for a company, I'd want to put our control charts online and then want to be like, yeah, here's a 3D inter or here's an interactive control chart where you can hover over the points and it can tell you and I can put notes on it and all these different things. And it would be like an HTML, HTML or Java object. Like I'm, I'm all into like 
I'm a very type of like flair person. I'm like, hey, it's got to look cool and the points got to like glow and like I feel like Brian, just make it simple. Just make it just just just, just, just. I'm one of those big idea people. Big orange big ideas. That's all like the slogan. So, what else do we need to know? What else do we need to know? We need to know a totally different type of model. So here we go into lecture. Get ready. We need to know a totally different type of model. And we need to know about these decision trees. And this goes all the way back to Stat 201. I think, Hannah, you had 320 with me, right? Did anyone have 201 with me? Madeline, I think you had 320 also, right? I'm thinking about all the names I know before this class, like Madeline and Hannah. If you go all the way back to 201, we talked about decision trees back then. You did 201, that's what it is, Madeline. Hey, and Caroline too. Yeah, so we did, not 320, took it in the spring. There you go. So we did, and then Kelsey also, yeah, I'm like, I know all the, I'm like, I know the names. It's so good to have, I, man. So yeah, you, the first time I taught last summer online stats one, that's so awesome, Kelsey. Was it, what well, wasn't boss? What did we do last summer? I can't remember. Everything's a blur. Terry does the boss now, and I miss the boss even. But when well, I never get to really meet boss students. So what we did in 201, way back in the day, is we talked about these models. The models we talked about right here were just decision trees. A decision tree partitions data, and it just kind of splits it apart based on some variable. Does that make perfect sense to everybody? As in, if we want to predict somebody's height, we could say, well, let's look at their weight. These people weigh more than 150, so they're probably taller. These people weigh less than 150, they're probably shorter. Now, now we're, we're not saying they are, but we're going to split them apart and be like, okay, these people go here, these people go here, then we split these apart. And this is why it's called like a decision tree or a partition model. Who's with me on this with the visualization that we're just saying, here's everybody, and then we're going to split them apart. And we do this by the way the data is structured so that we can create partitions in the data. Does that make perfect sense what's going on right here? It's like, hey, let's uh, split the data here on this variable. Can't grab it. Split the data here. And then let's go inside of this partition here and split it here. So you can see that split right here, right here. This is the inner split inside of this split right here. There's a split right there that is happening right here. Now, we don't always get like perfect data at the start. We sometimes get spaces right here that are very weird. Now, you could you know, make some, you could say, okay, split across this diagonal line, split across this diagonal line, but we don't split that way. I, I, sometimes I wonder why we don't do these things. It's good questions. We do it by splitting within one of the X's. So you have two X's, right? You have X1, X2. And you might say, well, how in the world could we split these datas up and have them be properly classified? We can properly classify these datas just by doing singular splits. Here's your first split. Split it up just like this. And then you'd have left and right. Then we go over here and we say, okay, now split here. So we split within the split there. Then I think we split here next, it looks like. And then we split within this one right here. And then we split within this one right here. So what are we doing? Think of the P word. We are just wetting our data more and more. A thousand points first person, so you're following along. We're just taking our data and just making smaller and smaller what's of it. Keywords you should know related to these models. Who knows? First person, thousand points. See so you paying attention right here. Partitioning, Caroline right there, and Hannah and Adam. Blue right there. Top three right there. Got it. 500 points, everyone else. But we're doing um, just nice points today. Nice job, everyone, following along right there. So this is partitioning right here. And here's the biggest thing. When we do this, we can do it for a what variable? Or, can't go to the next slide now. <laughs> or a what variable? We can do this for a what variable? Or a what variable? What it, these are like squares and circles. And these are, they're numbers. Cat or quant. Yep, exactly. Sarah, 500 points right there. You're exactly right. That's what we're trying to demonstrate right here is that we can do this for a quantitative or a categorical. I had to zoom in so you can see it's numbers a little bit better. Yep, just categorical variables, 
quantitative variables. Either or, doesn't matter. The model will try to put the things that are the same group together, or it'll try to put things that have the similar mean together. Like if you notice here, these numbers, it might be hard to see, they're generally smaller, these are bigger, and these are kind of medium numbers. And eh, it's got 100 there, so are these the big numbers? The whole goal of this partition model is to put things with similar means together, and the whole goal of this model is to put things of the same category together. So when you partition on a categorical variable, it'll have a different metric by which it measures if it's achieving its goal. We will look at things like AUC once again, we will look at things that like misclassification and accuracy, and we'll have a cool new thing called Gini and Entropy. So Gini and Entropy are two new terms you'll have to think about right here, and we'll have the Gini coefficient. is G-I-N-I, -I, not like uh, the index of a country, um, the index disparity between, I think, wealthy and rich, but the Gini coefficient, we'll talk about more. It's a measure of impurity. So what would you like your Gini coefficient to be? You'd like your Gini coefficient to be zero. Zero is the minimum Gini coefficient, as in this one would have a Gini coefficient of zero because, and I'm talking about just this partition in here, because it's 100% pure. You do not want an impure partition. And then how would we measure this one right here? Go back to the classics. How do you think we'll measure how well this is doing? How would we measure how well a quantitative variable is doing? Who's got it for 500 points? Classic stuff right here we should know. How are we gonna look at what makes it pure if it's all the same group? There we go, Jordan and Bajorna, both of you get 500. Uh, purity is measured by if it's all the same group. So this right here is very, this is pure. This is pure right here. Can I highlight, I can highlight on it. This is pure also. This is pure because it's all the same. It has no impurity. This one has impurity because it's it's a mix of the two groups. Does that make sense, Vedrana? That this has impurity because it's not all the same group. This has purity, this has purity. Purity means all the same group. So you don't want impurity, which will be measured by Gini and entropy. Entropy is information lossage technically, but still a measure of impurity kind of how we use it. And that does the start of the slides. So I kind of hopped around a little bit here, but we're just trying to understand what model we're making. These are non-parametric models, which means they're not distribution-based. We're not basing it on the normal curve. So guess what? There's no assumptions of normality. Also, since they're non-distribution-based, we don't have to worry if the data is skewed. You may be like, mm, data is skewed. we got to normalize it. Nope. Since they're non-distribution-based, we do not have to worry about normalizing data. We don't even have to worry about putting things on an even playing field because things are just distances apart. It's like, it's like you have a thing of Laffy Taffy. You could stretch it out and cut it in a spot, or you just smush it together and cut it in a spot. You're still just going to your data and making a cut above or below a certain point. You're just saying, cut here on the data, and then these people go here. It doesn't even matter how far they are apart. Like, okay, these things are really high up there. No, you're just going to a spot and cutting the data and then separating into groups. So it doesn't matter how far they are apart. It's I say these things because this is like, <laughs> I was creating transformed variables and Petri was like, why are you doing this? And I was like, because you know they're skewed. And he's like, it doesn't matter because <laughs> you're not changing the order of them. I was like, oh, you're right. Because it still just cuts in the same spot. I'm not changing the order of them. So yeah, I crack up because it's things that I did. Does intersection of the two red lines mean anything? Um, It, it, it kind of maybe does here, but that's not really how we will. Good question right there, Sarah. 500 points, crazy points today, up to, up to 2,000 points. Why not? Um, and thank you guys for showing up. Yesterday's attendance was a little low on it, oh, but you guys are here today. We got this. Um, this would not be on the test, but uh, because we don't usually do the cuts this way, this is more of a theoretical way, like just showing you a kind of a simpler model because we don't do cuts in that direction. We do cuts on one variable. So the way in which we partition data is not based on lines that would look like this. Um, we cut like this right here, and then we cut within partitions. So when you partition your data, you partition within the partitions. Does that make sense, Sarah? And you can see it right here that we have the first partition cutting on X1. So let's go right here. You'll notice the first partition cuts on X1 on less than this or greater than this. That's where you see on this slide right here, we're cutting right here, this is the first partition. And then we're gonna cut within this partition, and then we're gonna cut within this partition, and that's what you see right here is that we then partition within the partition on the left, 
and we partition within the partition on the right. So you won't really see, at least visually, you wouldn't see things like this or like this. They're kind of theoretical to show you what's going on. You would see things more like this where you partition within the partition. And then the visualization of the tree, here's the partition right here. First cut right here, which is exemplified right here. And then when we go within like the left partition, we would have that is when we cut this data, whoops, cut that data right there. That's the partition within the left partition, which is this right here. That is that left partition being split up. Will we get a result with no pure partition or will it be 100%? Um, depends. That's a really good question, Jinning, for 100 po 500 points right there. Crazy points today. Um, you, you want purity, you don't want impurity. And... Um, it's just a graphic thing, Jordan. Good question, Jordan. It's just the way you graphically drew it out to show you like the order, like the thicker ones came first and then the thinner ones. And we don't usually view that. That's a really good question. It's just graphically. Um, you do want the highest amount of purity and it's just problem dependent because sometimes it's really hard to get things separated because if you're trying to predict if someone will buy a product, it might be very hard to make a model that kind of predicts accurately if people make predictions. I mean, if people make, if people purchase. So it's it's a tough problem. It's just another tool and technique, but it's a really tough problem. So we got the first rule, second rule, review slide on what's going on. Which parameters or assumptions guide partitioning? Um, good question right there. So the parameters we have guiding this will be like how much we split the tree. So we're gonna control how much this tree splits. Because if we split the tree a whole bunch, we might what it to the data. If we split the tree a whole bunch, we might what it to the data. If we split the tree tons and 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 we just split it a whole bunch. 500 points, Jordan's right, overfit. Because you're learning so much from the data, you're extracting more information. Does that make sense how overfitting talk goes into this topping? That the more you split the tree, the more branches you have, and it goes through like a node, and then the leaves are at the bottom. If you're wondering why this is a tree, <laughs> you have to look, you don't look at it this way. If you're wondering why it's a tree, like why is this a decision tree? You go over here and you do the following. You say, okay. <laughs> do you see the tree now? Wait, <laughs> go zoom out. Do you see the tree now? This is now the tree. If you're like, how is that a tree? It's a tree now. <laughs> I don't know, I crack myself up. There's a leaf, there's a leaf, there's a leaf. Do we get the brown pen? No brown pen, really? More colors. Wow, it's really hard to find a brown pen. It's everywhere there. Let's see. There is best, best drawing on YouTube. There, there's the tree. There's the tree. That is the decision tree. So it can keep growing. It's more like a decision bush because it kind of goes out like that. <laughs> 500 points right there, me off, Adam. So that is what we have right there. Beautiful. It's, my fiance can draw. She can draw. I feel like she's like, no, but no, she can draw. I can't draw. I can't draw. So she's very talented. I said, I don't know. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> Adding a new rule will keep splitting the tree apart and um, splitting into, yeah, into two adds a new rule. So all we're trying to do here is create more and more rules. And as Anisha points out, um, one of the things we're going to control for now is how many times we split the tree. If we split the tree none, we'll actually get the naive model. So you could just not split the tree and have the naive model, which would just predict the probability of the of the overall level. So if most people don't purchase, we'd predict everyone doesn't purchase. And that would be the naive model. The naive model would not split the tree at all. And we would just have the base probability that no one purchases because maybe 20% of our customers purchase, no one purchases, and then we don't split on any other variables. And that would be the model with the highest what. The naive model has the highest what. I could make this, I hate doing written questions because then, if only there was a way to not check for caps, but then some of these people don't know how to spell the word, boom, bias, Yaoji, 500 points, yep, bias. The naive model will have the highest bias because it it has no information. The naive model doesn't take in any information. The naive model is just the base probability. It doesn't use any of the X's. The naive model is extremely high bias. And um, the more you take information, the lower the bias gets. But the more information you take, the more model dependent you are on the information. So the higher variance you have. Bias variance, they just do this. 
The naive model, since it has such high bias, will have low variance, which means it's going to work about the same of crappy, sorry, <laughs> it's going to work about the same of horribleness on the same, on like a different data set. It'll be like, oh, it doesn't work on this data set very well. Well, it doesn't work about the same on the next data set. <laughs> so to make a prediction with the tree, we just go through the tree. All you do is you just go, do, 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 and then you go down to here. And here's the big thing, though. When you get down to this leaf, you have to ask a question. 500 points first person. We'll do one more. We'll do one more lab. One more lab, that's it. We'll do the lab on Monday. One more lab. It'll be easy, don't worry. When you get down to the bottom of the tree, you have to ask a big question. When you get down to the bottom of the tree, you have to ask a big question. What question do you need to ask yourself at the bottom of any tree? And it goes back to something we've been covering a lot today, because we mentioned it here. When you get down to that bottom of the tree, you need to ask yourself a certain question. You get down to that bottom of the tree and you have to be like, okay, wait a minute. How am I going to make this prediction right here? How, what is the big question you have to ask at the bottom of that tree? What is the big question you have to ask at the bottom of the tree? Now she 500 points right there. You have to ask if it's categorical or quantitative. And I know this doesn't say categorical and I know this doesn't say quantitative, but that's what's going on. It literally, in the first day of 201, hopefully you got to do this. We play Mario Kart. And you know what? Like, I want to figure out a way to do that online to play Mario Kart, like via like the internet. Like if we could do it on like Twitch and be like, hey, it's Stat 201 first day. We're playing Mario Kart. We're talking variables all day. Maybe I could do that next semester. Like go out and buy Mario Kart for the Switch and be like, hey guys, we're doing tournaments here. We're playing Stat 1 Mario Kart on Twitch. Like hop on in, we're talking variables all day. And I don't know, I just want to incorporate as many video games as we can to class. We'll figure out a way to do that maybe. And so sign up to our Twitch channel, more on that later. But with this right here, we have the type of variable. Isn't there an app that might connect to the internet? Maybe. Twitch does it and Mario Kart, you can play online and they let you play it on Twitch. Um, good question right there, Madeline, 500 points. And classification is for categorical and numeric is for quantitative. And why am I stressing this whole Mario Kart thing? This is the first thing I teach people in statistics. This is the first thing I teach on day one. And here it is in the last week of, of BAS 474, we're still talking about, is it categorical? Is it quantitative? We have to know when we're making predictions. If we get the bottom to the bottom of the tree and it's categorical, we will predict the what for this group. What will we predict for this group if it's categorical? We will predict the majority level. So if it's classification, we're going to look at the majority level. As in, what does that mean? In this leaf, if most people purchase the item, if like 70% of people purchased, like, oh, 70% of these people purchased, then we will then say this person probably purchased. Does that make sense? That when you get to the bottom and you're making predictions, if like down here, 70% of the people purchased, you're like, oh, well, I guess if someone's there, they'll probably purchase because 70% of those people purchased. But what if we're predicting how much money people will spend? Thousand points. If we're predicting how much money someone will spend and we get to the bottom of the leaf here, what would you use to make a prediction here? If you get to the bottom of the leaf and you're trying to predict how much money people will spend, what would you use for this leaf to predict for an individual in the leaf? Like if we have new data or something, what would we use to make predictions if it's numeric? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll predict how much they'll spend, the average. And you know what's really interesting about this? These two things, majority level, average, both of these, both of these are the what? The majority level and the average are just the what when we make models, if we just do them for categorical or do them for quantity and we just use the majority level or we use the average, 5,000 points, and I mean it. Both of those are just the what model. Who knows this? Both of those are the what model. The majority level or the average Caroline, you're right. 5,000 points, Caroline. Crazy points today. Yes, only do that like once or twice. It's the naive. It's, it's just the, yeah. So when you get down here, you're just going to use a naive model. Does that make sense? If you're predicting categorical, 
you'll predict the majority level of that group. If you're predicting quantitative, just predict the average of that group because you're basing it on that group. You're like, okay, most people in this group are this. So let's just say most people will purchase because most people purchase. 80% of people down here purchase. And I'm just making that up. But if 80% of people in this leaf purchase, sure. If someone's in that leaf, they probably purchase because 80% of people in the leaf purchase. That's my best guess. What if uh, people in this leaf spend on average $800? It's quantitative. Well, if someone was new in that leaf, they probably spend $800 about because that's the average for that leaf. So they're probably close to their average. So that's what we're doing right here when we make predictions. If it's categorical, we predict the majority level. If it's quantitative, we predict the average. That is the key things you need to know. And it goes back to the variable you're dealing with. You have to know what variable you're dealing with. If the answer is to the, yeah, so yeah. We won't really deal much with visualization on this. Let me zoom in on this. And it's in the assignment a little bit. So, well. So right here, you get a little helper thing. That's why that last slide doesn't matter so much because even I don't memorize that because not every tree always follows this. But the question is, we're trying to predict if somebody will make a purchase. And we're gonna ask, are their loyalty days less than 357? Let's say this person has uh, 200 loyalty days. Will I go to the left or will I go to the right? They have 200 loyalty days. Will Brian go to the left or will Brian go to the right? They have 200 loyalty days to the left or to the right. Do we look at the nine molecules? Um, they'll only be the, and Jordan is right, you go to the left because they do have less than 357. Um, so do we look at the naive model for cat and quant when on the last leaf? There'll only be one. So depending on if you're predicting like, will someone purchase? Um, because this is a categorical model. This is predicting yes, no. So this one right here, we would predict this person would not make a purchase. And there's no quantitative model to this because this is a categorical Y. So whatever the type of the Y variable is, like if it's cat or quant, we'll make this into, and this is often called like a classification model where the other one is called like a regression tree. So you've got like just a little terminology here you might hear. Let me put this in the chat so people can see it. Um, classification tree equals categorical and regression tree equals quantitative. So a regression tree is thought of as quantitative and a classification tree is thought as categorical. They're both trees. You can call them partition models. You can call them decision trees. So it's like all decision trees are these things. All partition models are these things. But then sometimes people are specific and they'll say like a classification tree, which means a categorical Y. Or they'll say a regression tree, which means a quantitative Y. And you can be like, well, logistic regression, but it's just the terminology people use. So I just wanna make sure if anyone ever hears these terms, they hear like a classification tree, they're gonna be talking about a tree like this right here where we're trying to do a categorical Y. If someone hears a regression tree, their people use that to refer to a quantitative Y. And then those are both decision trees and they're both decision trees are partition models. Does that help make sense of that, Sarah? So you wouldn't have a cat, you wouldn't have a categorical and quantitative prediction down here, depending on what you're predicting, you only have one of those. So this is a classification tree and it predicts probabilities. And then we use the majority level. So you'd predict people here would be no, you'd predict people here would be no, you'd predict people here would be yes, and you'd predict, predict the people here would be yes. Good questions. See, look, that's so hard to read at this distance. No one's, if you can read that, congratulations. Often during the process of making a prediction, it may be the case that you have more information than the tree needs. For example, you have data on X1 through X10, but only a few of these variables in the path that you follow. Yeah. So. What's really cool about the trees is that they naturally incorporate interactions. You do not have to worry about putting interactions in there because look at this. When you go back to this slide right here, you'll notice where we split on 4x2, what? Thousand points keyword. Where we split on within x2, what? So here's x1 and that's the answer basically. Where we split on in X2, what? There's a D word we need. Where we split on in X2, and this is the idea of the interaction right here. Jordan right there, 1,000 points, depends on X1. So it's not that X2, like X2 at a certain amount is going to be the right amount. Sarah, 1,000 points also, following along, practicing. And this is what an interaction is, is that the way in which X2 tells us whether or not something is a square or a circle depends on x1. 
So when x1 is lower than this, we split right here. When x1 is higher than this, we split right here. So x2 does not have the same relationship with the dots and dots and triangles. I don't know what those are. Um, it's dependent on x1. The way in which x2 explains a dot or triangle depends on x1. Now you don't have to worry about interpreting that, but the idea is that since we're splitting inside of variables each time, it's actually going to incorporate these interactions for us. So that's the coolest thing about trees. Also, the trees don't use every variable. I've, you're nearly never going to see a tree use every variable. You're going to see right here that it'll choose the variables it splits on, and it'll split within them. It can reuse the same variable also. But trees naturally incorporate interactions. Here's some keynotes. Trees naturally incorporate interactions. They don't have to use variables you give them, and they can use variables you give them multiple times. Think about this. If you're trying to explain somebody's height, what do you think? Or let's, let's change it. Hint, hint, hints. If you're trying to explain somebody's weight, what do you think would be a really good variable to collect? What do you think would be a really good variable to collect to explain somebody's weight? If you're like, hmm, let's try to explain how much people weigh. Let's collect a certain variable right here. What would be a good variable to explain height? Exactly. Height's a really good X variable. So you might say, oh, people who are taller than six feet probably have this weight on average. And then basically what you've done, you say, okay, the people who are taller than six feet, they weigh like 180 on average. People who are lower than six feet, they weigh 140 on average. Now, you might be like, wait a minute. How about we say the people who are lower than 5'6 weigh this, the people who are between 5'6 to 6 feet weigh this, the people who are above 6 feet weigh this, and age too. And then you would incorporate that. There's so many variables you can collect. And what do you do? Here's the coolest thing. You just take all your variables, you just dump them in the model, and you say, hey, deal with it, model. You say, you figure it out, and the model figures it out for you. So the model will figure all of this out for you. The model will do all the mathematics. It'll do all the splitting. You don't have to worry about it. It's going to look through the variables. It, it'll incorporate interactions, like it'll split within variables, and it can use variables multiple times. It just does all the work for you. It's like super cool. Here we go with a prediction right here. We just see that somebody comes down here. We've got the Steve and I. I wish the key was here. The no side is to the right. Cool. So this person we ask, uh, was their amount sold in week one less than this or greater than this? It was greater than or equal to. We go boop down to here to this side. And then were they in category A, B, C, or D? They're in category, I guess they're in category B. So we go here. And then their sold amount was, where's their sold amount? Oh, it's four. There we go. So it was greater than, and we have this right here. And the way this would be phrased, it would have to be, um, was their amount less than this? Because the left side is the yes. I don't write test questions where you have to memorize, you know, this would, I would not present that graphic. I'd probably be even a little hesitant on showing this graphic in a boardroom meeting because they don't need to see it. But if I'm going to show something, I'm going to have this up here. I'm going to have the key at the top. Like I can't imagine not showing the key to people because it's like, well, what, which way does what mean? Don't worry. Wouldn't do that to you. See, there's the key again. That's what we do. You will see the key. I will never not show you the key. You do not need to memorize yeses to the left. That's doesn't matter. You can go right here and you can see that smoking within these variables, if somebody is smoking, yes, the predicted birth weight of the baby is water to the non-smoking. If somebody is smoking now, so this is smoking now, we say, are you smoking right now? And they're like, yeah, this, this is, well, I'm not smoking now. Okay, now I'm smoking. <laughs> Oral jokes. Don't, don't, that's Brian's personal opinion. Personal opinions with Brian. Don't don't smoke if you're pregnant. There we go. Personal opinion. Um, I mean I can't control that, but anyways. So <laughs> I got some crazy. I just that's a that's a hot take right there. So um, with this right here, we see that there are lower birth weights, and it's incorporating um because you might say, well, what about like babies that are kind of more premature because these are babies that there was less gestation time. So if you look, the first thing that really explains baby weight is like, how long were you pregnant? And it splits on gestation and then it splits on gestation again. So the first and most important variable in explaining how much does a baby weigh is, and these are in grams right here, if you're wondering, um, the first and most important variable on how much does a baby weigh is how long were you pregnant? And the most premature babies are predicted to be how many grams? The most premature babies are predicted. You see, it's a decent question, but the answer is kind of obvious if you just kind of look through the numbers. Like, the most premature babies are predicted to be what weight? See, what I should do, uh, I mean, yes, but tell me their weight in grams. Yep, yep, yep. 
this one right here that's the weight that's the predicted weight in grams and there was only a sample size of 10 but this was where we were seeing the difference they were predicted to be and that's in grams so and yeah so someone might have converted it for us or not what if i were to put this on the test i'd probably put uh 2077 right here so as a test question if i were to manipulate this data i'd go down here to this number and change this number right here to be 2077 that way it would be the lowest number but you know and then you got to be careful with your test question you got to be like gestation is how long people have are pregnant for mother's height is how tall the mother was and smoking now defines that a mother is currently smoking within the last year of being pregnant and then um i would change this to 2077 and i would ask uh the most premature babies um are predicted to have a birth weight of what and so people might grab this number right here thinking that it's the lowest because the reason it's too easy of a test question is someone could get it right and just be like oh premature babies have smaller birth weights but i'd put this right here and make it a wrong answer where it's 2077 and then people would see a small number and be like oh that's the smallest number so we got to do the smallest um 4.8 oh that's crazy adam oh i'm got yeah that's wow now it's, it's pretty interesting and so the, the, does that sound pretty accurate to you, Adam? Like, does this seem like an accurate prediction to you right here? I think my mother is, okay, so my mother, I think, went full term with me. And I literally just saw my birthday recently because I was, like, at home going through stuff. Like, my parents were like, get rid of everything you want because I'm I send a bunch of stuff home with them. So my mother is yes to this. And is my mother's height taller than this? My mother is... She's like right at 5'7". Today, my mother's side on stream right here. My mother was not smoking. So three, that's a, this is my prediction. Go here, if you want, go here and uh, do your own prediction. I believe, because is, did Brian's mother have a, ooh, 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 problem, problem, problem. Did Brian's mother have a gestation less than this? No. Did Brian's mother have a gestation less than this? No. Was Brian's mother smoking now? No. There's Brian's predicted birth weight. Um, <laughs> I like that answer. So Brian's predicted birth weight, I think it was like eight pounds, eight pounds, 10 ounces or something, or I was like eight pounds, 10 ounces-ish, I think. So 3363. So what is that? 300, let's ask, let's ask Siri. What is 300, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what is 3,634 grams in pounds? That's very, I was, it's eight, it's eight pounds basically. And that is very close to what I weighed as a baby. That's very close to my baby weight. So very accurate prediction from this model. Um, and the model would predict Brian would be eight pounds. You can go through here and see what it would predict for you, but just be very careful. I did almost make the mistake. You literally have to read the question. Was my mother's gestation period less than 38 weeks? Was it, and that's a no. Was my mother's gestation period less than 40 weeks? That's a no. Was my mother smoking now? That's a no. So does everyone see how I'm going down the no side? Does this make sense how to make predictions with it? Like right there, Andrew, Andrew, almost, Andrew, almost 10 pounds. But does everyone understand how we are making predictions with this model that we pick either the yes side or the no side, depending on how we literally answer these questions? Be careful because I did make a mistake as I was going through it. I did go to the wrong direction at one point. Um, it's just easy to make mistakes. Easy, 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 easy. And this model, this is the mean. This value right here represents the mean of the 165 babies that are in this category. This is the mean, which will also be the prediction we are making for those 165 for any, any new babies. So right there. If there's an interaction, partition models naturally incorporate interactions. It's in slides again. Cool. Helps out. We've got birth weights and reacquisitions. Same thing going on right here. All this good stuff. We see it. There are many different approaches for developing rules. One of them is based on minimizing the impurity, a partition that only contains one class or is 100% impure. So here we go. This is a big slide again. You notice we pause on some slides and we make sure we know exactly what's going on. Oof, I like this right here. Imagine this was something asking you, do we use categorical or quantitative for these? So, which you might be able to I might be able to do that one. I'm gonna be bold. I use it for the other one. Um, so write in the notes, write right now for a thousand points, write either something like QQQ, CQC, CQQ, QQC. Do it for all of these right here. Do it in order, going with entropy, genie, 
and sum of squares. That's a huge hint for that. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> this one right here, the bottom one should always oh, literally says for that. I mean, so yeah, it gives it away. You you can tell the answer because it it gives it away right there. Yeah. So um, what's the or what are what are these? What would you use these for? Well, when would you use these metrics right here to gauge and to fit your model? I know it's Connor's right. Bay Jordan, you're right. Basically, yeah, Connor's here giving some huge tips. So by why? Uh, let's see. Thousand Voices got it first. Yeah, yeah. Sarah's right. Sarah's got it. This is categorical. This is categorical. This is quantitative. And and just think about this. Sums of squared error sounds just like what? What do we what do we use to gauge for another thousand points? What do we use to gauge our quantitative mo models all the time? What have we been using consistently to gauge how well a quantitative model's been doing? So good to have you here, Connor. RMSE, yeah, which which is another like it's not yeah exactly. Look, you just like you guys you know what's going on. It's RMSE root mean square error. So it's it has to have a quantitative miss because we need to the error is basically the residual. And then we're going to take the sums of the squared error, which you will literally, you could go inside of each partition right here and try to minimize the error within that partition because each partition will have an error from its mean. So we'll look at the predictions made from each partition and then try to minimize that. Now, entropy is defined as information leakage or lossage. And then Gini index, which I prefer, is compared to guessing accuracy. And so we can figure out, I like Gini index a lot, and we'll look at some Gini index here. Okay. This right here has a really high impurity on the left side because if you look at the impurity, we see a bunch of blue and red dots. Over here, this has low impurity. So once again, impurity is defined as it all being one group. So if you want a good definition of, of purity, uh, the more homogeneous the partition is. What does homogeneous mean? The more everything in the partition conforms to one group. So purity, means everything in the partition is the same group, is the same category. So you want it to all be the same, like purity. Let's say you go to the soft serve machine. What is the, you've got chocolate and vanilla. What's the most pure? Now there's two answers to it. What is the most pure from the soft serve machine? You see, I want the impurity. I want the impurity. I'll take it. I'm gonna go to that middle knob. I'm gonna get the impure. Singular chocolate or vanilla. But what does Brian want? He wants the middle one where it mixes the chocolate and vanilla. I think everyone wants that. Because then at the end, you, just, you mix it both together. And so that would be impurity because it's it's got the mixture between the two. It's not like, I mean, chocolate and vanilla are fine together. But in, in terms of model, you don't want your chocolate and your vanilla mixing together. You don't want your yeses and your noes in the same leaves. You want to separate them out. That's the goal of a partition model, to partition them apart. So very, very important right here. We want the purity. So entropy right here. It, it's entropy is really good. We won't calculate it. Entropy is one way to measure the impurity of a partition. So you don't want high entropy. You want to have lower entropy because you do not want impurity. It's a numeric value that uses the proportion of individuals in a partition that belong to each class. In information theory, entropy is related to the amount of information contained in a message, a string of zero and ones and zeros. Entropy and information are opposites. Messages with more entropy contain less information. Partitions with more entropy contain less information about an individual class. So we do not want high entropy. The goal is that we minimize the entropy and maximize the information. Do not worry. You're not going to have to calculate it. But just realizing that high entropy is bad. I mean, if you want to take a note right now, high entropy bad. That's why we call it like information leakage or lossage. That's the way I've always heard it called. Um, maybe other people have heard it talked about that way, but it's, you just don't want to have high entropy. You're losing your information. Bad, bad, bad. Here's just calculations on entropy. I will not have you calculate this. Do not worry. But you can notice here. Notice about this. If you notice here, we mostly have everything in this one group. Notice here how we have mostly everything in this one group, and the entropy is a lot lower. What is the lowest possible value of entropy? If we did this right here, we'd get log base two of this, and you can just kind of calculate through, and then we'd have zero, so log base, all this good stuff. But we can lower right here with the smallest being zero, which would mean zero information lossage, which would mean it's 100% pure. 
and it's the negative right there. Once again, you do not have to calculate this out. It's just that you want lower entropy. So as far as it goes, just because I wouldn't, it doesn't have a really good interpretation in the business world. It's just like lower entropy is better. It's information lossage. It deals with the impurity of our leaves. So let's give three keynotes on it. Lower entropy is better. Entropy deals with us losing information. And for trippy deals with the impurity of the leaves. So you can see right here where we have good purity, good purity, lower entropy. What is going on right here? Here, we have 10 out of 30 that are in each group. So you know what this is? This is actually the most impure it could be. You have class A, B, and C, and you have a third, a third, a third in each group, which is 10 over 30. If you're wondering, this is 10 over 30, and that's, yeah. So here, this is the most impurity, and this is actually the highest entropy model. This model is horrible. It has the highest entropy. So you could compare these models and see that the model up here is worse because of the higher entropy. So why do we need things like entropy? We need it to compare the models. But we also have Gini coefficient coming up here in just a second. So Gini index, Gini coefficient, also called Gini index. I don't, sometimes I call it the Gini coefficient just because, oh, kind of what I miss. Sometimes I call it the Gini coefficient just because, I don't know, Gini index makes people think of the one for like country index. So I like to call it Gini coefficient. So it's the proportion of individuals in the proportion who belong to class I. Let's look at the mathematics on here. A Gini index of zero means that it's 100% pure. So once again, what do you notice about Gini and what do you notice about Gini and entropy? Gini and entropy are both measures of how what the models are. Gini and entropy are both measures of like when they're higher. Be careful, that's not the answer. Gini will <laughs> there we go, how impure. Yeah, they're measures of purity, but the higher they are, the more impure they are. What is the goal? of Gini and uh, what is the goal of Gini and entropy? The goal of Gini and entropy are to get them to zero, which would mean the model's pure, which would mean at the bottom of the model, everything's in the right groups. Does that, does that make sense like visually to you that if we have a Gini or a, um, if we have a Gini index or if we have an, an entropy of zero, then we would have everything split up into the right groups. You also have to know it's categorical because we're doing Gini or um, entropy. So everything would be in the right groups at the bottom. Perfect purity. Everything, no impurities. So the impurity is zero. Good stuff right there. I hope it makes sense how we're using Gini and how we're using entropy. They are both measures of impurity. And the goal of impurity is to get them to zero. Good note right there. Gini and entropy are measures of impurity. The goal of impurity is to get them to zero. You'll see some mathematical calculations right here. Nice and easy. And one of the things I like is I love this equation. Now, this is the same mathematics we saw previously, so it's a different calculation. Now, when it comes down to it, the random guess model, or kind of the worst, I see, I think about these theory questions. If you are doing a two-class probability, what is the worst impurity you could get? If you're doing a two-class classification, what is the worst impurity you could get? This is a three class classification. What is the worst impurity for a thousand points? What is the worst impurity you could get with a two class? Jordan, you're right. What is the worst impurity you can get with a three class? The answer to the three class is that. What is the worst impurity you can get with a four class? If you had a four class, what's the worst impurity you could get? thousand points if anyone knows this one because this one what is the worst impurity you could get with a four class Payton, thousand points pain's right what is the worst impurity you could get with a five class do you see the trick i always think about putting this on the test but and i'll show you the mathematics if you like but it's, all you would do is just solve this out with one minus one fourth squared plus one fourth squared plus one fourth squared plus one fourth squared and you'll see what it, and it's 0.8. How about, and then one sixth would be uh, 0 0.8, 3333, 3, 3, 3, and then one seventh would be, oof, I, forget, 
kind of guys i'm like it's, it's one four two eight is one seventh but I'm, I'm not doing the rest of it in my head um if you notice what's happening right here you can see how it works and then sort of the next one and then and then the next one <laughs> and so this is as you go to higher and higher class groups um you can reach higher amounts of impurity because you could have more things separated out among the groups and impurity with more groups approaches one so the highest theoretical Gini coefficient is one, the highest theoretical. So um, yeah, yeah, here I'll show it. Cool, cool. Um, bah, 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 bah. Here we'll just cheat, look at the equation. One minus that squared plus, yeah, okay, cool. Okay, let's do it. Da, 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 da. Ah, wrong thing. Okay, let's stop over here. Okay, so what it is, is we have to go here and we need to go with a two class classification. Let's say we did pretty good. We've got here 20 observations. And we're going to say with 20 observations, we had two here. And that means, and we square this, so we'll put a big parentheses on this. And then we're going to add that to this right here. Let's say this. Okay, so this is a two class classification. Does that make perfect sense to everybody? We have two groups. We're classifying things as yes and no. And with this, we have here that two of them are in this group and 18 of them are in this group. Does that make perfect sense? Within this leaf, we have like two yeses and two noes. Does that make sense? There's 20 observations, two are yes, two are no. Ah, uh, yeah, and it's really, you would don't, you, you could, it'd be so hard to reach that. You'd have to have like infinite groups to have 100% impurity. I don't even know if a genie index of one is even theoretically, it would mean it's 100% impure. Um, yeah, you could, no, I don't know. That's a really, that's a tough theory question. I think the theoretical limit of genie approaches one, but sorry, this goes into a really good theory question, Sarah. The highest possible genie index is a one, but it would require infinite groups where you, yeah. It's, it, I think a genie index one is only theoretically possible, not, not, you can't achieve it. Your genie index will approach one as you have more groups. Does that make sense to anybody but me? Because it's, it, it's only theoretical and it's hard to show theory stuff. And I, maybe I can try to show that. So yeah, it can approach, it'll approach one as you get more and more groups. And we were kind of showing that previously in the chat with the 0.833, the 0.856, the 0.875, the limit. So this might help it. The limits as the groups increases, as you increase the number of groups, the limit on the maximum Gini coefficient possible approaches one. But to achieve a Gini index of one, you would need infinite groups because the limit of the maximum Gini coefficient you can achieve for impurity approaches approaches one. Does everyone, it's a, the, the limit is a, not a geometric series. It didn't help me out. It's not geometric because it's going to be uh, one half, three fourths, uh, four fifths. Is that that's not geometric? Is it five six, uh, six sevenths, seven eighths, eight ninths, nine tenths? That's the series, and the series will approach one. Um, the series will never achieve one for the maximum Gini coefficient. If you notice the mathematics I was doing right there, that follows the pattern of literally. I write in the chat. This is very just theory, 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 theory. The the um the maximum Gini coefficient follows. This is the um, possible maximum. So it'd be, that's that's the series. Sorry, I'm so bad with series. I don't think it's geometric because it doesn't have like a ratio decrease. Um, but Nin, please help us out. What kind of series is that? Is that exponential? It's gonna have a curve that levels off. It's gonna have a curve that does that. So Nin will hopefully help us. So it, if you notice, if X is infinity, then it'll, it'll go to one, but it never achieves one. So the maximum possible Gini coefficient is one but it only approaches that theoretically in limit. Who who understands that theory stuff I just said right here, and then we'll hop back to calculating Gini coefficient via this. But hopefully someone understands the theory of that right there. That, okay, good. So the possible, the theoretical highest impurity is one, but you would only achieve that if you had infinite groups. Yeah, so only theoretically. I don't think that can be achieved one because in the case you are not subtracting length from one, which, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's the, the theory, it's like theoretically, but, there's no, yeah, there's no possible way to obtain it like in actual calculations. You would just get very, very high Gini coefficients with very large classifications that have very large impurities. Man, I love the big questions. You guys like make me think and then I've got to like be like show it mathematically. Oh man, see today, we got the Red Bull today. 
we're good to go. Okay, so with this right here, we would have four over 400 plus uh, 18 squared. Oh man, I can't do 18 squared in my head. I should be able to do that. 18 squared, 180, and then you add in 64, and you add in 80, 144, and 180 plus 144, 324? Is it 324? So don't tell me if I'm wrong here. Is it 324? I can cheat. But what fun is cheating? Do it in your head. Is it 324? Let's find out. 18 times 18. Tell me I'm right. Yay, it's 324. We got it. Okay, good. We did it. Now we got to do 4 plus. That's the easy part. We'll add these two together. Okay. So when we do this right here, we can look at the amount of impurity. And the impurity now for this equation, when we calculate the impurity right here, when we calculate the impurity right here, we get... <laughs> Why can't I do this on my head? Now my brain's breaking. We get 72 over 400. So you just solve this out and you get 72 over 400. And then you reduce down 36, 18. Okay, cool. Cool. I, I divided it by four basically and we get that. Does everyone see how I've achieved this number? Does this make sense that the Gini index of this partition right here is 0.18? which is a measure of impurity. Does that make sense? You'd love it to be zero. Because think about the quickest way to make this zero. We can start changing the numbers, and we can quickly make this zero by just doing the following. Make one of these leaves totally what, Brian? Make one of these leaves totally what, and we will get an impurity of zero. Make one of these leaves totally what, Brian? Or you can just tell me one number. Yes, yeah, exactly. Boom, boom, totally pure. And then you would achieve this right here. And then the math turns out to that. So does, does that make perfect sense? Now, the if you look at the math, totally pure. What's the worst we could do, though? What is the most impure we could possibly do? What is the most impure we could possibly do? What is the most amount of impurity? Like, what is the most impure these leaves could be? Exactly. And if you do this right here, you'll get the following. And so that, wait, 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 wait up, 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 up. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to square a hundred. I'm 10. <laughs> I was like, something's wrong. The math, the math is not working. <laughs> I can, I can times 18 by 18, but I can't times 10 by 10. There we go. And so now we achieve this, which is the worst we could achieve. Does it make sense that that is the worst we could do right there? So it should make sense theoretically that the worst you could do is have a 50, 50 split. It's better when you have more because you wouldn't say, well, isn't 11, 9 worse? No, 11, 9 is more pure because you have 11 of one group and 9 of another group. So the best you could do is have 20 of one group and 0 of another group. And so when you think about this mathematically, um, we can try to draw this out right here. Hopefully it's making a lot more sense right here. But if you think about the bottom part of that equation or the second line I drew, you basically are adding together. If, like the worst you could do is one half here, and then you're adding it together twice. Um, well, but no, it's, it's, it's one half squared and then you're adding it by how many times it exists. So if it was like one third squared, yeah, 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 yeah. And it'd be one third squared. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> so the worst you could do with one third is one minus one third squared times three. And if you think about that, that's always just going to be a third. So because you're going to undo it, does that make sense right here that the worst you could do is one third, one third, one third, one third, and you'd have that three times. And since you're adding it together three times, adding something together three times is multiplying it by three. And then the worst you could do on one fourth is one fourth squared times four. And if we, if we start putting in notation, let me try this real quick in notation. Jordan's got a question because I wish I was better at mathematical theory times n. Is that correct right there? That might be correct mathematical theory. And then you can see right here that it's just going to be worse we could do is just 1 minus 1 over n. That is the worst we could do. This is the worst we could do right here. Does the equation say anything about about which is the most pure or how impure the entire model is? We'll be doing that here in just a second, Jordan. Really good question. We can look at, um, so 
the the equation won't optimize to try to make one partition more pure but we can look at an individual split and we can look at the overall model and we can look at different choices so there's the impurity of a leaf and the impurity of a split so please take a note there's the impurity of a leaf and the impurity of the split and right now we're mainly focusing on the impurity of a leaf so when you look at a leaf right here the impurity of a leaf like this right here the impurity of a leaf would be judged by how many are in each group which now we have the most impure leaf so we're saying okay we have a leaf with 20 observations that's where the 20s are coming from there were 10 in group a there were 10 in group b does that make sense what this was saying we have a leaf with 20 observations there were 10 in group a there were 10 in group b this is a very impure leaf so this equation right here is the impurity of a leaf we'll be talking about the impurity of a split in just a moment we don't really do multiple class uh, predictions right here, so it's kind of a moot point, but this shows mathematically that the highest impurity you can get is one minus how many groups there are. One, one minus one over how many groups there are. Does this make sense? Uh, did I do everything right, Nin? Nin's my go-to to make sure Brian's doing his math accurately. Woo. How's that look, Nin, for um, are we accurately explaining that the maximum amount of impurity we can get would be this right here hopefully that shows theoretically and don't worry i don't plan to it's just kind of what's going on with the slides perfect yeah i can do i can do math <laughs> it's not really high level math but i'm very proud of myself so cool so we have right here that's what's showing us the maximum impurity with three groups this is a three group classification with classification groups a b and c so we have here three level classification a b c classification and we have here a maximum impurity has been achieved, which is one minus one third. It's just the highest amount of impurity you can get. You can see a third, a third, a third, really bad classification due to the 10, 10, 10. And then we see, yeah, there's 10 right there. And we see right here a really pretty good classification with 27 in this group A, two in group B, and three in group C. So we don't just do the impurity, well, here's sums of squared error. We'll talk about this for a moment. So sums of squared error is pretty easy on this though. Like, I think this is the downhill. We've got a few more topics today, but sums of squared error all we're doing for sums of squared error is just going inside of each leaf and comparing each observation to the what all we do for the sums of squared error is we take what it actually is and we take the what for each leaf thousand points what are we taking for each leaf we're taking what something is like brian's predicted to spend 850 dollars the mean is oh I gave away the answer the mean is 800 what is Brian's squared error? Brian is predicted to spend $850. Yep, and it's the mean for each leaf. So every partition has a mean. Remember, we make predictions based on the mean of each partition. So Brian is Brian spends $850. Brian is predicted to spend $800 in his leaf. What is Brian's squared error? Brian is predicted to spend $850. Brian spends $800. What is Brian's squared error? Brian's squared error would be what? Brian's squared error would be what for a thousand points? Who knows? Crazy points today. Crazy points. What is Brian's squared error? Brian spends 850. Brian was predicted to spend 800. What is Brian's squared error? Silence. No. Who knows? You got it. Phaedra Nut, great job. 2,500 because we just square Brian's error. Brian's error is 50, you square it. And then what would we do to all of the errors in the leaf? We're just gonna sum all the squared errors. Does that make sense? Like we're gonna find out every error for every person and we're gonna square their error, then we're gonna sum it. And we're also going to do it for every single leaf. So we will literally do this for every single leaf. So we're gonna go to the first leaf. We're gonna look at people and compare them to their mean take that error we're going to square that error we're going to add up all their errors then after we do it for the first leaf we're going to go to the second leaf we're going to compare the people to their mean and so here's where we compare the people to their mean then we're going to take their error we're going to square it and then we're going to sum up all those squared errors does this make sense what we're theoretically doing like for the baby example all the way back here you would go and you would say okay there's a baby here who weighs uh, 2,190 2, pounds. What is that baby's squared error? 
there was a baby right here that weighed 2,190 pounds. What is that baby's squared error? What is that baby's squared error? There was a baby in that leaf that weighed 2,190 pounds. Ounces, 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 grams, grams, grams. <laughs> 2,190 grams. Crazy huge baby. What is that baby's squared error? That baby in that leaf weighed 2,190 uh, grams. Well, think about how far is it away? It's one away. What happens when you square one? What do you get? That baby was one away from their mean of that group. It's one. Anisha, 1,000 points right there. You're right. There's another baby in this group that weighs 2,186 grams. What is this baby's... Uh, what is this baby's squared error? There's another baby of the 10 babies that weighs 2,186 grams. This baby, uh, the mean is right here. This is the mean. So the prediction made from the group, Sarah, good question, is the mean. This is the mean of the group. Nine, because that baby is three away. You don't even have to worry about if it's positive or negative. You'll just square the how far it is away. Because negative three, positive three, squared is nine. And then you would add that to the previous error. You're going to take all of these errors. You're going to square them and sum them up, the sum of the squared errors. And once you do it for this group, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna go over to this group and you're gonna say there's a baby in this group that weighs 2,950 grams. So what is that baby's squared error? There's a baby in that group that weighs 2,950 grams. That baby's squared error is what? The baby weighs 2,950, 49. Because all you're doing is comparing it to the mean of the group. So if you look at the formulas we've been looking at, that's exactly what we're doing here mathematically, is we're just going to the mean of the group, comparing the observation, squaring the error, and then we'll add them all together. And we'll do this for each group. We'll go to each group, we'll go to like this group, we'll look at the observation, we'll, we'll figure out how far it is away from the mean, we'll square it, and then we'll add it to the other ones. And we'll keep doing it for each group. You don't just do it for the first group with like one leaf, you do it for every. This looks like a bunch of crazy mathematics, but who here is like, Hey, it kind of makes sense. Can I get some yeses or thumbs up in the chats to be like, yeah, these equations, they kind of make sense. You're just comparing something to the mean of the group and you're seeing how far it is away. You're squaring that and you're adding them all up. Great job. Thank you guys so much. I love it. Here we are where we're splitting. Now, the way we split is to optimize the sums of squared error. So why would we split at 2.45? If you look right here, we're choosing to split on this X right here. Now we split on the X's, or we could split over here between these X's right here. Now, if you split on this second one I'm drawing, which would make this and this, then the sums of the squared error, how would we calculate it? Well, we'd look at Y. What would be the mean of the Y for the right group? For the right group, the mean of Y would be what? For the group on the right, the mean of the y would be what? For the, for the right group, the mean of y would be what? The mean of the y would be what for the right group? It'd be 6. And guess what? That's what we're doing down here. If you look at this right here, you'll notice that we're just using the mean of this group. That's where the 6 is coming from down here, because this 6 is the mean for that group. It's merely the observation of 4 minus the mean of 6. And there you go. And then how are we getting this right here? Well, this is the mean for this group over here. So all these are, are the sums of the squared errors from their respective means. So everything down here is the sums of the squared error. And how do we pick where to split? Whatever reduces the sums of the squared error. We don't have to do this though. It'll do it for us. It'll check here. Ooh, how many, I guess technically, if, if it, how many, how many spots do you think this will check to split in? How many spots do you think this will check to split in? How many spots will it check to split in? 5,000 points first person, crazy points. How many spots? Okay, I think I got the answer. <laughs> Basically giveaways I have a row. Got it, okay, good. How many splits are possible in this data? Lose track. Not five. No one said the answer yet. I'll say the name of the first person who gets it. Four, Madeline got it. Great job, Madeline. Got that 5,000 crazy points. One, two, three, four. There are four spots we can split in. We could split here, 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 
or here. It's not really a split if we, because you're not splitting the data. It's you're not splitting if you go to there, because that's you're not cutting the data and putting it into different groups. Does that make sense? Because you wouldn't split it apart. You would just be like, don't split. So you could split here, 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 or here. And you're splitting on the X's. You might say, well, there's repeat values of Y. Doesn't matter. That's not what we're what we're splitting on. You split on the X's, and that's got it. So here is probably the last topic for today. Eh, we'll mention CP. We'll mention it, but we won't get into it. So when we talk about the impurity of a split, you have to do a weight to it. So when we do the impurity of a split, all the impurity of the split is, is the weighted impurity. Because think about this. If we were to only have one observation over here and we had it completely pure, what would the impurity be? If we only had one observation and we had like, it was like, hey, we got this one observation classified pure perfectly, then what would its impurity be? For the one observation classified perfectly, its impurity would be what? It would have an impurity of not just low, you're right with low, zero. Thousand points page or nine, Sarah, right there. It would have an impurity of zero. And then zero times something which is one would be zero. But think about that. It's not gonna help maximize this because you're gonna have other observations over here and they're gonna be weighted by how many they have and then you do an average. So when you think about this right here, figuring out the impurity of the split is just, you know, like how many do we have in this group by their impurity? How many do we have in this group by their impurity divided by the total? Like this is like the average impurity. Does it make sense to think about it that way? It's like, okay, we wanna see, um, you know, how tall people are. We have um, 10 students who are five feet and we have 20 students who are six feet. So then you would put 10 and 20 right here, 30 students total. You have 10 students over here who are five feet and you could literally solve this out because you could put 60 inches here. You could put the uh, 20 students here, that's 20. And you could put the 72 inches here and the answer should be 68 inches. So if we solved the mathematics and you said, okay, I have 10 students here with 60 inches, uh, 20 students here with 72 inches, 10 plus 20, and all you're doing is a weighted average. Does that make sense that this is just a weighted average telling us what the impurity is based on the way we split? So when we look at the split, we can see how we are doing for the impurity of the split. And this is a huge thing. We'll probably do some examples tomorrow, I think, or Monday. And you can see right here in the slides, looking at this right here, we can figure out how we do on the split. So when you think about this right here, take a look. If you were to split, oh, I hate that I can't get my cursor for that. If you were to split A into its own group, what would the impurity for A be? The impurity of only A would be an impurity of zero. Just like if you were to split only B into a group and have B just be by itself over there, the impurity of just B by itself would have an impurity of zero. Ah, can't highlight it. It's that number. You guys can see that's a zero. So that's where the impurity of it comes from. And this comes from there being one observation. It should also be clear to see, take a look at this. What is the impurity of that partition right there? What is the impurity of that partition? Just look at it visually. Be like, wait a minute, there's two B's and there's two A's. What is the impurity of that? What is the impurity of that? It's the mathematics would be one minus two fourths squared plus two fourths squared. Hint, it doesn't look very pure. <laughs> the impurity of that one is what mathematically? Right there, it's 0.5. Does that make sense that that has an impurity of 0.5 because it's it's a 50-50 split? That being not just, well, yes and no. Um, the way that one works out mathematically is what we were doing earlier when we had this right here. The impurity of this right here would be calculated. There were four observations total. This is good practice. Well, I could just erase that. So with the four observations, there were, oh, it's not what I need to, oh, that's a bummer because we have to change the numbers. With four observations total, 
there was two fourths, two fourths, which makes this four sixteenths and four sixteenths, which it still is that mathematically, but technically, if you want to show it this way, it's eight sixteenths. And so this is the impurity for that, that partition right here. This partition right here that I have highlighted, I just mathematically calculated with the two A's and the two B's. Take a look at the mathematics right here, not that one. The mathematics right here is the calculation to figure out the impurity within that partition. Now, this one right here is very easy mathematics. We, it's so easy that you can just theoretically look at it. Because for that one, we'll open up a new sheet. For that one, it would be, even though this is so simple, we should not do it, 1 minus 0 over 1 squared plus 1 over 1 squared. And you can tell this equals out to what now? What does this equal out to? Well, you might be saying it in the chat. So that is 1 minus 1 right there, which is 0. And that's how the impurity is calculated for the partition that is right here. This one has an impurity of zero, and there's one observation in this. This one that I have highlighted has an impurity of 0.5, and there's four observations. And then we weight it by how many total observations there are. That's got it. The, this is something I usually see people having trouble with. And then we'll talk about CP next time about the complexity parameter on how we make these splits. It's, it's pretty interesting how it chooses to make the splits. It's so cool. And we should finish up most of these notes. Man, look at that. It's so beautiful. So yeah, what's the optimum complexity parameter? This is, Anisha was asking earlier on, what we'll tune on. Um, so the complexity parameter will control how large we'll grow the tree. And so complexity parameter is the cutoff we need to achieve. We need to achieve a certain amount of decrease in impurity, or we need to achieve a certain reduction in sums of squared error. That's, so the complexity parameter controls the reduction. Um, continue to rule as long as the impurity decreases at least by the complexity parameter or we see a reduction of at least the sums of squared error. So the whole point of the CP is to help us find the optimum value of splits. So CP really controls the splits and we'll try different values of CP and that's what we tune on. So the CP controls how large we grow the tree and the value of, C of CP says we need at least this much of a return. Could you help with me interpret? Yeah, let's do that, Jordan. You got it. Thank you so much, Jordan. Good, good notes right there. So yeah, so you can see here if we want more of a return, like these trees will split more. These trees will split less because we're saying we want more or less. R takes a CP. Larger values of CP lead to smaller trees. Totally makes sense. And so this is the last big note right here that the larger values of CP, because you're saying you need a big return. So if you put a large value of CP, you're saying I need this big return for the tree to split. If you take a smaller value of CP, then you're saying, yeah, split if you do even a little bit better. So these trees over here are the trees that are gonna have tons and tons and tons of splits. And when you go over here, you're going more towards a naive model. So, oh, and look, this is the accuracy. So actually we wanna go to bigger trees, sorry. Um, since we're fitting on accuracy right here, we want to have a tree that has more splits. These are worse trees. These are probably just the naive model right here, which is the naive accuracy. We do better with the trees that have more splits. And you might say, well, which point is it in here? I mean, you can look at the, the, the thing right here. The optimum CP is decided to be this. We don't have to worry about like looking, we can look at the plot to say, okay, smaller values of CP are doing better. And it's almost the smallest value of CP. The value of CP we chose is that one right there. And I might even do a finer tuning grid on it. I mean, they're all, they're within one standard DVU. Oof, I know the, the, there's a lot of uncertainty in that related to it. So if you look at the one standard deviation rule, you got it, Jordan and Kelsey, let's do it. Let's hop over to some office hours. We will, we will start next class with CP. We, since we, we mentioned it, but that was not the goal today. You're welcome. So let's hop in here. Let's do some work. Put myself in the box right here. Okay. I believe, is this the right one? That's a different one, right? Homework. Is this the right one? Yeah, here we are. Okay. So could you help me with interpretations of 2G and 2H? You got it. Let's do it. 2G and 2H. A, B, C, D, E, F, F, F in chat for G. Okay. So there's G. Okay. 
Is this right here? What models can you eliminate from consideration? Which model did you select? Oh no. <laughs> Do we have to make a bunch of models? Use train and perform a search over K for a nearest neighbor's model. Additional values of K along the sequence 10, 15, 20, 65. Include a plot of the object created by the train. So we've covered nearest neighbor. If you remember, we covered it a while ago, and now we're seeing it come back here again. Include a plot of the object created by train to see how the estimated generalization occurs with the K. Print to the screen the row of the rows selected and generalization. Cool. Typo. Can you run through all of three? Yep. We'll go back and do three after this. Um, so it looks like we need to make our... Stop acting weird R. We need to make our model right here, and we've got A, B, C, D, E, F. There we go, nearest neighbors model. So we need to do K nearest neighbors, and we need to make the K nearest neighbors grid. Once again, the best thing to do a lot of times is to go over here and type in K nearest neighbors, and we're in the selection right now. Now we're fitting on, which one, what are we predicting? I'll see what we're predicting here in a moment. Here's K nearest neighbor, cool. And let's go ahead and grab the K nearest neighbor. And we have everything we basically need. And as long as we're fitting on, well, I think we're fitting on something different. I think we're fitting on accuracy right here or something. Or maybe AUC, we'll find out. Okay. And that's the wrong thing. There we go. We're going to take this and bring this over here. This is when Tyler and them were in the chat and they were saying, use these notes. Use these notes. So let's go to the K nearest neighbor. Fit a sequence right here, 10 through 70. So k equals sequence from 10 to 70 by 5. So here's the k nearest neighbor grid right here. Does, does this make sense? It's five-fold cross-validation. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, it's just k-fold 5. There it is right there, train control. Yeah. Oh, that's and it's got the parallel. That should be right. Why don't we always allow parallel? Parallel processing. There it is previous that's the first oh, wait, wait wait what's going on my brain's breaking uh, tr control let me see our fit control fit control and here we are cool Trick control, string control, there we go, and drop it in, grab it here, drop it here, there we go. Um, yep, and run that right there. And we've got the k-nearest neighbor method. What what, var what variable are we predicting, Jordan? We're predicting what variable in this model? Let me clean this up while we do this right here. Let me clean up the code, make it look better. And I need to make a subset. So I need, to, not a subset, I need to make a uh, training data set. So it's hopping in the middle of the problem. Next year's wins. Cool. Let me copy that. Next year's wins. What percent of the data are we holding out? Or is this the one of the ones where we don't hold out data? What percent of the data are we holding out in a, um, and I have to make sure I have my, um, ah, what are you doing? Y tilde x dot. There we go. Oh my gosh. It got all crazy. There we go. Um, let's see right here. We've got preprox center scale. Cool. I'm just right now just cleaning up the data, making it look nice and neat. Hold out years of uh, with 2011 or before. Yeah, remember that right there. So we need to go here and we need to go to this is the EX6, is it? Or is this the data we appended on? Is this the EX? Yeah, this training. Yeah, it's the earlier years would be. Is this EX3 NFL? Is that the data set we're using? And then is this the one where we had to scan in data also? But is this the EX3 NFL data? Um, if so, we want to go to subset. This will, as long as I'm writing out the code right here. So we're doing like all the previous questions right now too. And I believe, da, 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 there's a year. Cool, it's spelled that way. Year, and we want to do 2011 or before. Year is less than 2011. And we go here to train. And let's take a look at it. Well, we can look at the train this way. And we've got the year. And we double check. The year is 2011 or less. So everything's right. Have I done everything right right now, Jordan? Is that we have, we were subsetted. Um, <laughs> and so if you look at the subset code right here, um, we're seeing it all nice and neat. So we load the data. We do this right here. We create our expand grid. 
We've got here the fit control. So that creates our validation subset. We go right here, we've got the K nearest neighbors, we've got next year's win, we've got K nearest neighbor, K nearest neighbor grid, all this good stuff right here. We run it. And this is what's so cool about it. And since we are plotting next year's wins, this is a quantitative, so we do want it to be fit on um, our MSE. So we're gonna fit on our MSE, let's plot it. Cool, that's got it. We make a new new subset with all highly core variables in linear. Oh, we do? Oh, well, okay, so make sure, oh, we did that yesterday, right, Jordan? We we're doing that yesterday with all the previous data, right? Um, and this is 2G we're going over right now. So this is 2G right here. And so what's the verdict? What models can you eliminate from considerations? Which models would you select? So this right here, so make sure you go through the steps because we were doing that yesterday. We were eliminating the highly correlated variables and we scanned in the data. So probably most of that, but here's the whole, here's the whole meat of this problem. So my answer is gonna be different because I've not done all the previous steps, but I wanna point to something right here. How are we going to know which models to eliminate? Uh, let's go ahead and look at the results right here and see what this problem really wants us to talk about with 2G. With 2G, what is the point of this? The point of this is that the best model is the model with the what is what. The whole point of 2G right now is to know that the best model is the model with the what is what. Ooh, that's a really, this is going to be very... Lowest RMSE. And the lowest RMSE is this one here. And my answers are probably gonna be different than other people's. But that's the lowest RMSE. At least it looks like to me. And I think I ran the code to find it. Uh, K30. And it is K30. It's the fifth model with a with a K nearest neighbors of 30. You can also see it over here in the graphic. Um, this one has the lowest RMSE right there. That is the lowest RMSE right here has the lowest uh, value of the RMSE. And the thing is, and we should see this, I might take a quick peek at the key too, but you should see here, as I'm kind of noticing, that all of these models do about the same. Because how would we compare these RMSEs? We would look to see if the RMSEs are within what of each other? And my answer could be different than other people's. But you would look to see if these RMSEs are within what's of each other. One standard deviation, yeah. And if you look right here, the smallest standard deviation is about 0.07, uh, and, but then we would still use the higher standard deviation, the higher RMSE standard deviation. So all of these models are pretty similar. If I am correct, we should not really be able to eliminate any of these models right here because they're all virtually identical in how they explain. Um, yeah, so what you're noticing right there is we're noticing virtual identical models. And let me hop over and take a look at that. Um, so let me take a look because I'm seeing no differences between the models. Does that make sense, Jordan, that the RMSEs of these models, let me show it again right here. The, the RMSEs of these models are all within one standard deviation of each other. Um, and so with that, I really don't see any differences between them. Um, I don't see any, any key differences. It's like all these models virtually identical. And that's why I should see over here. Let me just take a quick check. But I do not see anything that says to me differences between models. I'm gonna look at your guys. Yeah, it looks similar results. Oh, I want you to compare the models. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, good. So what's your verdict? What models? It's not talking about this, of course. Um, here's the thing is you need to do regularized regression. And we should be able to make a regularized regression really quickly here. So I'm just going to take and grab our regularized regression. So let's go ahead and just grab that code and drop in a regularized regression right here. So to do a regularized regression, let's grab right here. I've got the right seeds for this now, but let's drop in a regularized regression. So this is the regularized regression and let's see the differences right here. So the regularized regression, when you look at regularized regression, here's what we need. We're gonna have a GLM net grid. What am I missing? Oh, it's got a hashtag right here. So here's that. And then let's clean up the code real quick. Let's make our code look nice and neat. Span grid there, that's good. We don't need to see how many models we're making. It's just how many models. I mean, that might be in the question. Um, that goes there. We're setting the seed to control the randomness. 
there's the data, y tilde x comma data equals, there's the method, tune grid, this is just how we're selecting parameters for the model, tune con uh, fit control, this is how we're doing our validation, oh no, 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 and, and there's that, preproc turns them to z scores, we're good to go on that, and so then this is just the center scale part of it, going off the screen right there, and there's the plot. Okay, we should be good. Let's make our expand grid. Let's run it. We're creating the model. Let's plot it. And then we also want to look at the results right here, which the code for looking at the results is the same thing. We can just take this right here and go to the best tune and go to the results and take a look at this. Um, so here's the plot of it. If you notice, this model right here has a typical miss of 2.92 about. And what I would record, and let me give some... Um, yeah, we're talking about how it compares to the other models, Jordan. We're talking about how does the K nearest neighbor model do compared to the other models? And now I pulled up a GLM net. So with this, I'm just gonna change the name of the model to a GLM net, and I'm gonna then plot my GLM net. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just taking a look to see how the GLM net did, and the GLM net looks like the following. And it looks like my results might be different because my best tune is going to be the one over here with an, a lambda of 0.1 and alpha of one. So that's my best tune. And then um, we could go to the best row. Well, let's do that. So we do have that code up, right? Where is that code? So now we can steal it again. That should be, oh, I can figure it out. So we go to the rows, we wanna go to the best tune. So shouldn't it be, well, we can figure out because we do this. It's 35. So yeah, so it says 35. So we could go here and go to position row names of that and that should do it because that prints out 35. So the row names literally just gives 35 and that only returns. Does it make sense what I've done right here, Jordan? We should just kind of practice and be like, how can I get the results? I went to the row name of the best tune and then I returned the data in that. So this right here returns uh, just the best row. Um, so this model right here has an RMSE of 0.858 or 2.858. And it has an R a uh, residual a root mean square error. Oof, oof, oof! I don't like that. Um, you can, here's the thing you want to do is you can quickly change your results right here to the um, to the K nearest neighbor, and you can just change this right here, and you can compare the K nearest neighbor. Um, these two models are similar in their performance. When you look at the RMSEs, um, both RMSEs are very similar. And this one has a lot more uncertainty. This one still has a pretty large amount of uncertainty, but this model's uncertainty is well within one. I mean, this model's uh, explanatory power, the RMSE, its typical miss, is well within one uh, standard deviation of this model. So this model's RMSE is well within one standard deviation of the other model. And so generally speaking, these models are about equal. And is that what we say over here? Let me take a look, 2G. See how yours should turn out. Da, 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 da. The nearest neighbor and regularization models are comparable and much better than the vanilla. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now the vanilla, if we go to vanilla, which should just be GLM. So if we go to the vanilla model, apparently that's not going to do nearly as well. So to make the vanilla model, we don't even need a grid for it. So let's think about what we're going to do to make a vanilla model right here. To make a vanilla model, we are just going to do GLM. Since it's a GLM, it needs no grid. Why does it need no grid? It does not have regularization. It is gonna have a validation portion. Um, so this is where we're just optimizing on bias. So now this has gone to just vanilla regression. We're not gonna call it GLM net. We're just gonna call it GLM. And we're gonna run this right here. And sure, it got mad, but those are just warnings. Well, hopefully nothing went too crazy. We're gonna take the code right here that we have, which shows us our best model. And we're going to go down here and put this to GLM. And this will just do it for the GLM not model now. And whoa, <laughs> is this what you're seeing in yours, Jordan? Hopefully someone reacted the same way I did. Um, is this what you see for your model with no regularization? Is that what you see with your model with no regularization? Did you get something similar to this? I could go look at the key, but you should get something like this and I, I haven't moved the junk variables i haven't removed the highly correlated we did that yesterday if you're looking at for yesterday we might cover that still but when you do the non-regularized model are you getting something similar to this 
and and what were thing were you wondering about how was I able to tell which and I look at this and I'm like oof that's that's bad yeah and yours is probably mine's even worse probably due to the junk variables and stuff like that and let me look at 3.525 let me look at what we get over here da -da 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 -da. where's the GLM there's the grid. Yeah, three more. You are getting the right answer on the key. You're getting, so you're doing everything just to confirm with you, you're doing everything accurate. At least you have an RMSE standard deviation of 0.39, which is still further off. Yep. And if you, if you think about like the level of uncertainty, so the whole point of 2G, which we kind of jumped down to like the end of it, is to compare the models. And I'm doing slightly different answers right here. So you should, if you're watching this, you will not be getting these answers. Jordan, you can keep that in the chat just so people can get a sanity check, which I think we do have some in here anyways. But that's a sanity check for people. If you ran the GLM, you should get that. And if you get that for the GLM, you should get the next one for the, the regularized regression and the K-nearest neighbor, which I did set up the grid properly here. So seeing how you set up the K-nearest neighbor grid, which is going to be just the values on the grid of this, and then all you, like, how much am I changing to change my model? I just have to know whatever you, the smallest thing. So all you're changing is, and you could literally just call this your your tune grid if you want. Well, see, it makes, me, makes more sense to call it GLM net grid. But the coding, hopefully, is not the hard part anymore. People usually tell me that, like, later in the class, they're like, yeah, the coding's not the hard part. So with 2G, what do you really notice is that you, the what's the one model you should not use for 2G? Like, if you had to say... The model we should not use for 2G is definitely this. So you're like, 2G, the answer is don't use this. <laughs> That's basically the shorthand. Um, yeah, exactly. This is exactly it. If you don't, if you don't use either of those, um, I mean, if GLM Net and Canaris Neighbors is is the better are the better models. They stand out. They're the standouts um, because they're within one standard deviation of each other. Um, where uh, vanilla regression is just, it's far away. It doesn't do nearly as good. So we have to have ways of comparing these models and you could you could even find the Z-score if you want. And you know if you take the uh, differences between your RMSEs, which you're gonna have something, like you're probably gonna have something like this right here. Um, here, wait, delete. Your RMSEs are probably going to be something like this. Divide that by this right here. And they're more than two standard deviations apart. Does that kind of make sense there, Jordan? To be like, okay, these are pretty different in their predictive power because the the RMSEs are more than two standard deviations apart. So they're they're pretty far apart. Like it's like, okay, they got a big difference. That's a that's a big difference in RMSEs for the model. Was there was it two I? Two I. Let's look at two I. H I V C D G H I. You should have found that the optimum value for alpha was one, which corresponds with lasso. There we go. Hey, thank you for that tip. That the great thing about the lasso is that the, can some of the coefficients can be zero. It can do that. A ridge, since ridge squares them, you have this problem with ridge. That ridge will try to make them really, really small. It might say that right here. The only value of alpha that allows for that, in fact, point to the screen, the column nam names, there are 57, and this creates over a page of output. Don't, don't worry, it's not excessive since, yep, exactly. Other variables that get in the coefficients optimized. Blah, blah, blah. Based on your analysis, does this does this year number of wins help predict next year's numbers of wins? Explain why. So we'll look at this right here. Note the vector. Blah 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 blah. blah, blah. Gives you a vector of all predicted names that get a coefficient of zero in the model. So what we're doing right here is we're actually looking into the model and we're seeing. Can you talk about how you found uh, which model is worth in one standard deviation? Um, the formula is. Yeah, let me put that in the formula. The formula for that is uh, RMSE model one minus RMSE model two divided by uh, larger uh, RMSE standard deviation. So it's the RMSEs of the two models. You just take the RMSE of the first model minus the RMSE of the second model and you divide by the larger of the two standard deviations. So the reason I picked 0.39 is because for the other models, um, like I would pick this as the standard deviation, but if you're going to compare this model right here to this model, you can. it doesn't matter which way you subtract them because it's just going to be a difference. So I'm going to compare these two models. Do you see I took both models RMSEs and then I'm going to look at the standard deviations. Okay, that's 0.67 and then this one's 0 0.10. So I will I pick 0 0.10 or 0.67? I have the choice right now between to compare them with 0 0.67 or 0 0.10. Which of those two, 0.67 or 0 0.10 will I pick to compare these two? 
the bigger one. And they're more than two, they're, they're basically two standard deviations apart. So there's a big difference. And that's the one standard deviation rule that if models are within, within one standard deviation of each other of the larger of the two standard deviations, then they're basically similar. So these models are drastically different. Uh, this model here without the regularization, just a GLM is very, 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 very different. I'm going to show you the output right here on the other question, just so we can kind of hop to it. Um, so let's show what 2i looks like. And what you'll notice is, is we'll probably, let's see if we see a coefficient of zero. So much output. Wait, where is it? Yes. Okay. This gives you a vector of all predictors at a coefficient of zero. Cool. Okay. Let's drop this in here. So the question asks, da, 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 da. here it is. Based on your analysis, does this year's numbers of wins help predict next year's numbers of wins? What do we see in the output? This. So what's the answer? What is this code showing us again? This code right here is showing us what? This code right here says, gives you a vector of all predictors names that get a coefficient of zero on the model. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Gives you a vector of all predictors names that get a coefficient of zero. What's a coefficient of zero mean? It has a coefficient of zero. So these are all the things that have a coefficient of zero. So since it has a coefficient of zero, the answer should be no. Because if it has a coefficient of zero, since it has a coefficient of zero, does that make sense? The code is showing you everything that what this is doing is just finding where the coefficient is equal to zero right here with the best tuned model. It's just saying, where do these models have coefficients of zeros? And with this right here, and we're subtracting off, we're just, yeah. And we get these model, these, these variables right here. These are the variables in the model, which are not really in the model. I know that sounds confusing, but these variables, um, like if you we were doing it earlier, if you were to write out regression equations like this, then these would have coefficients of zero. So to going back to 320 for a moment, to have a coefficient of zero means you would have coefficients here as your estimates of zero. So if you were to have a coefficient of zero, it would have no impact on the model. So if you look at this right here, these have coefficients of zero now, then no matter what high school GPA is, it does not impact the model. That's what it means to have a coefficient of zero. It means this has no impact. And this is, these are the estimates we're doing to mathematically solve through the model. Does that help make a little more sense right there? Like if this were to be zero, high school GPA would not impact someone's college GPA. So since wins has a coefficient of zero, which we found by the code, we would say that uh, wins has no impact on next year's wins, which is confusing, but that's, that's the way the math did it. That's the way the, the model solved it out. I think who wanted 2H, let's take a look at 2H. Does that make sense to everybody right there? It was like that. Or like, no, that does not make sense. Hopefully, if something has a coefficient of zero, it has no impact on the model. It's like a weight. It's like a weight to the variable in the model. Awesome, Vajra. No, thank you so much. It's like a weight to the variable. Two eight, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I. Did we do H? Where's H? Where you at H? Out of curiosity, let's see how well each of these three models did on the holdout using post resample, a command from caret. Run the post resample to find the RMSE on the holdout. Remember to put set C 2019 on the same line immediately put before post resample for the nearest neighbor model. Since it, if there are any ties, they get broken at random. That's what I was talking about throughout the class where I was like, if there's a tie, it will. That's the way it does it. It, it randomly does it. Um, are, are any of the models overfit? Okay. So how do we figure out if a model's overfit? To figure out if a model's overfit, we have to take how it did on the validation and we have to take some number and divide it by that. So we're going to take what our model did on the what and divide it by how it did on the validation. So we have to take our model how it did on the what and divide it by how it did on the validation. What are we what are we going to take to see if it's overfit? We're going to see how it did on the blank and then divide it by how that did on the validation. Kind of. I mean it actually I mean theoretically it is that because if you say how it actually worked on new data versus how it was predicted to work on new data. Thousand points he's got. Jordan, you get another thousand right there. But so you could say how it was how it actually works on new data versus how it was predicted to work on new data. So what are the things we're dividing then? 
to see if it's overfit. Um, cause you're right. It's like how it actually works on new data and how it was predicted to work on new data. And we can, hopefully it's close to one cause it's what like, it's so weird. Like when do you want things to be one? Well, if it's an F ratio, you want the F ratio to be large, but if it's this right here, you want this to be close to one cause we want it to work the way it was predicted to work. We want the ratio to be very close. So the actual, how it works on new data is the what portion of the data, how it actually works on new data is the what portion of the data. How it actually works on new data. Close, 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 close. I mean, that's that's pretty much you're it's, you're you're right there. I'm just gonna change what you said basically. Another thousand, Jordan. That's there. You go. It's the holdout RMSC because that's how it actually works on new data, and the validation RMSC is how it was predicted to work on new data. Like the the validation RMSC is an estimate of how to work on new data. No, no, no. It's yeah, you got it. I thought you said sorry for me. I was like, you got it. It's because you're like, how how does it actually work on new data? Is the holdout? How did we think it'll work on new data? I.e., predicted is the validation. So you're just getting a ratio of how it does actual to how we thought it would do predicted. So yeah, that's and so yeah, you just get the you know. So here you go. You don't want it to be ten percent more than the cross validation. So that's the validation portion right here. Um, remember the holdout sample only serves as a sanity check. Yep. So you, you do not, this this question, I say, I, I why do we not just pick the one that works on the holdout? It's so counterintuitive because you're like, we want it to work on new data. Why don't we just pick the data that works on new data? Why don't we just pick the model that works on the new data? Because what would we be doing? Could you do one example? Yeah, yeah, I'll show it here in a second. I'll show some answers, why not? Um, why don't we just pick the one that works on new data? Why don't we just look to see which one works on the holdout? Let's just fit it to the holdout. Because then th there's so many answers to this. If you fit it to the holdout, you would have no way to know if you overfit it. Be like, well, well then let's test it. Well, then why'd you fit it to the holdout? Because <laughs> you, you risk overfitting. And that's the, you, you would never fit something to the holdout because you have no way to test it then. And also the holdout's a smaller portion usually. You fit it. You train the model on the training. You create an estimate of how it'll work on the validation. And then you see if it works on the holdout to test it out. The whole point of the holdout is a test to see if your model works, to confirm to you it works. So when we do this right here, and we'll see it, I'll show some answers here. Um, when we do this sort of procedure, oh, I have it over here. When we do this sort of procedure, eh, we'll just go over here. We do, 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 wait, HI, are we on I? Two I, here we go. No, wait a minute, it's not I. Da, 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 H. Okay. When we're doing this right here, we're just taking the ratio right here. Do we not do the ratios in here? Ba, 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 ba. So this is the holdouts. I would prefer. I would prefer. I mean, here's literally the answers. So dropping some answers in the chat, helping people out. I'm, I'm probably not going to show many other answers. But um, Jordan, didn't you? You gave me one of your RMSCs earlier, right? Um, the RMSC on the um, vanilla was 3.525. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it does better. Okay, that's what it is. Yeah, see, it, my brain jumped a second. Um, it does better. Um, that's why my brain was like, wait a minute, we got the weird thing. Um, it actually does better on the holdout. Does that make sense, Jordan, that it's actually doing better on the holdout? Because here's how it did on the holdout. Here's how it did on this. And it's actually doing better. And this one looks to do a little bit worse. But I mean, probably not whatever the RMSE was for the K nearest neighbor, you would just take and you'd go and you would take the um, like, let's say it's this and you'd be like, OK, it's just three percent worse. So that would be like the K nearest neighbor does three percent worse on the holdout. Um, yeah. That, well, you see, even I paused on it and I was like, that's a big difference. And I was like, oh, but it's doing better on the holdout because this is the holdout and the. Um, the model does better. It, 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 it's just the structures of data can be weird. Remember yesterday when we saw that models were overfit and we, and so that'd be called an underfit model. We didn't extract enough information. So under, this is an underfit model, which kind of makes sense. It's not overfit, it's underfit. Does better on the holdout. I mean, it's just weird things that can happen by random chance. Love data. It's like, okay, it worked better on the holdout. And that's not a bad thing. That's a decent trick question on the test too. Things that make me pause you need to be like, wait a minute, that's a big difference. Oh, but wait a minute, it's doing better on the holdout. So it's all right, that happens. 
was there, I think there was a few other ones. What other ones were people asking about? Uh, ba, ba, da, ba, da. We did 2G, we did 2A, uh, 3A. Um, are you still getting the, I think initially, I think I saw that email this morning. I didn't, sorry, I saw it this morning. I didn't have time to respond. Um, you're saying you're getting different sanity checks? Let me check it out. But tenure balance, okay, so what data set? We're loading this right here. Weird noises. I don't know if I'm hearing things or what. Um, 3A and 3B sanity checks. They want to do 3 Let's do it. Okay, the tenure, checking balance, saving income columns are all quite skewed. Logistic models tend to be more effective when predictors are symmetric. So let's work. Oh, shoot. Be right back, everyone. Hey, oh, we're back. Okay. They're doing a fire extinguisher check and everything. So we're going to, let's see right here. So replace the values in each column with the log 10 of their values to symmetrize them. However, we need to be careful. The smallest values of tenure are zero or negative, and we cannot do the log of that. Thus, all tenures must add an appropriate number to the column. Okay, cool. So let's go here. Let's go to the min. We're using account data. This might be where the sand check is. <laughs> what do we need to add? What do we need to add to this column right here? What do we need to add to the column tenure? What do we need to add to the column tenure? <laughs> what should we add to the column tenure? Any ideas to what, what value we should add to the column tenure? Any value, any idea for the values we should add? What should we add to the column tenure? What should we add to the value? Is, mm, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, is it all but tenure? Yeah, so all but, you're right, you're right. So the other ones are negative, you are correct. Checking balance, let's look at checking balance. And pop, 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 up. there we go. You are correct. <clears throat> they, my brain got destroyed. <laughs> Okay, what do we need to add to checking balance? What do we need to, ooh, oof. Yeah. So we're gonna change all of these. What do we need to add to checking balance? And you can check it because if you know the answer, which you could just do this. There we go. That'll confirm that it says, make it so that the minimum is one so, um, you know, add an appropriate call value so that its minimum value is one before taking the log. So if you think about what we have right here, we've already done it such that we would add this value to this right here. And then we would take the log 10, I believe we're taking of this right here. And so we achieve this and then we can confirm we have the right answer because what, if this is one now, what is the log 10 of one? What is what is the log 10 of 1? Um, the reason we make it 1, and that's kind of the key. Why do we, so why would we make it 1? We don't want to transform it if we don't have to, but why would we make... why what, What's a good idea of making it 1? It has to do with the log 10. 
why is making it one a decent idea? Like, why would we do, why, what would be the point of making it one? It has to do with the answer we're about to see on the screen in a second. Because if the minimum value is one and we log tenant, we will get what now after we log tenant? So what is the log 10 of one? Because everything inside there is one, the log 10 of one is zero. So by changing the values here that the minimum value is zero, when we log tenant, the minimum val value is now zero. Does that make sense? So the reason we chose one, which is a little bit arbitrary, it's because now the minimum value is zero. If the minimum value was like 0.1, then it would be, it'd be negative one. But this puts it um, that the lowest value is zero. So it kind of helps right there. Does that make sense, Jordan? That um, by changing it to be one, it now starts at zero, which is just kind of a good place to start, like going from zero to this, and it's log 10. So you're like, okay, well, that value was transformed, yeah. And so now I believe I will do this. Do, do, do. And now we'll go here. And we have our way of doing it right here. We don't need to look at the mins, but uh, these values are going to have one added to them. And we could confirm that we've done it um, so that that's achieved. And what have I confirmed? It's that when you do this, uh, the lowest value here is one. Oh, they were doing the log 10. Um, yeah. If you do this right here, the lowest value will be one. This right here. Oops, too many things. This right here, the lowest value will be one because the lowest value was zero. And so there you go right there. And then we should see the lowest value of one somewhere in here. So that has these all transformed. We don't need the min around it anymore. We're just kind of doing a little practice work on it to see what we're creating. And we're gonna go here and take this. And we have to be careful. This is where the mistakes can happen because as soon as you start overwriting stuff, you can put the wrong thing in the wrong spot. If I if I, if I save at the wrong time right now, I will destroy my data. So I have to make sure what I'm doing right here is overriding checking balance with the log 10 of account. I think we're still taking log of tenure, right? So, da, 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 da. so let's replace the values in each column with log 10. Cool, cool, cool. Tell me if I do something wrong here. So tenure also, but tenure, you know, if we really want, we're good now, let's delete it. It's gonna look confusing if I do that. And so this will be tenure. And I need to make sure this is this, and that should be it right there. Does does this all make perfect sense? And do I have my code correct? I think I do. If I don't, I have to reload my data. Um, technically, people might say you should do the following. This is not a bad practice, is you could do something like this. This is not a horrible idea. If you, a lot of times when you're working with data, you might make a copy of your data and make it, make, make an original. So I could make a copy that I could then manipulate. And if I do make a mistake, I could just have the original. So that way if I destroy my data, because there is no undo button in R. So just kind of good data practices, you might decide, which it doesn't say in the question to do that, but that's not a bad idea because my data has just been changed. If I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake. We'll find out the hard way. Okay, let's see what's going on right here. Hey, we got it. Uh, Anisha, are you still here? Were you able to get this? Anisha, does this make sense right here? And then we'll see what other questions people had on three. Does that make sense? How are we doing on that? Did it, did that make sense how we changed the values and we overwrote them? It's kind of some good practice and good theory stuff right there. This is kind of symmetrizing our data, making it look better. Any questions about that right there? Good, like how to deal and make data symmetric. Silence. What other questions are there? Appeal on the Discord now. Looks good to you. Awesome. Let's see here. <laughs> Anyone on the? Oh, no one's on the I love potential test questions. Alex adds so many things in here. He's been the all star. Man, so many things. Well, I'll be looking at this a lot this weekend. So, more packing, more stuff. I think we'll hop back on here in a little bit. Probably get some coffee, get some lunch. But I think that's got it for now. Um, how are you looking on this assignment, Jordan? Pretty good. Pretty good going through it. A lot of output. 
just a lot of different model things, but generally kind of the similar steps of making a model, looking at a model, seeing how it's doing. But I will be back. So we'll probably do like four or 5 p.m. office hours. With that, it's noon. So everybody have a good day. We'll be back here in a little bit. Talk to you then. Bye.